Good evening and welcome to this evening's planning subcommittee meeting. I'm Councillor Sarah Williams from West Greenward and I'm the chair of the planning committee. I'm Councillor Peacock. I'm Councillor for Northumberland Park and I'm the vice chair. Reg Race, Councillor Tottenham Hill. Councillor Yvonne Save Bounds Greenward. Councillor Peter Mitchell, Woodside. Councillor Viv Ross, Fortis Green. Councillor Luke Quilly Harrison, Crouch End. Councillor Liz Morris, Highgate. Um, could you uh, let, try again, Councillor Basu? Yeah. If you could introduce yourself once more, please. Councillor Dhiran Basu, Seven Sisters Ward. Thank you. We also have officers present. Robbie McNocker, Head of Development Management. I'm Matthew Gunning, Team Leader. Fiona Ray, Principal Committee Coordinator. Rob Shosovsky, Assistant Director for Planning, Building Standards and Sustainability. Ed Tilepneff, Legal Advisor. Richard Truscott, Design Officer. We also have uh, officers joining virtually who will introduce themselves when relevant. And just to say, you don't have to look at the red light. If you look on your little screen, it'll say mic on as well, which helps. Um, this meeting is being recorded. All registered speakers should be aware that they will be recorded for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting. Members and speakers are requested to note the information set out at item two on the agenda, the planning protocol. Um, do we have any apologies this evening? We have apologies from Councillor Gina Adamu and apologies for lateness from Councillor Ibrahim. And are there any items of urgent business? No items of urgent business, Chair. Do members have any declarations of interest? No. At this point, I'd like to ask um, permission from the committee to vary the agenda. I'm suggesting that we start as published with Fordington Road, but then move on to the pre-app at Florentina Clothing Village as I, the next item, and then on to the Spurs Goodyard application next. Um, are members agreeable to that? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, also at this point, I'd just like to say I have um, allowed um, written documentation from objectors on Fordington Road and um, the Goodyear Spurs application to be distributed to uh, members of this committee. Thanks. Sure, sure, can I raise the point of concern? You may. Thank you. Now, my point of concern is, is the application, the Goods Yard and Depot at White Hart Lane. And I wonder if it was not possible to produce uh, the documentation in much smaller bite sizes. These are complex issues and, and the members are not professional planners. There are a number of professional planners in the room who, who would find it quite easy, I suspect, to, to go through the detail. But in order to give it the relevance and importance of which it is, it would be determined Tottenham for the rest of this century. Uh, 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 and in order to give it the level of importance and detail and and consideration. It is far too much uh, in one report such as this, and perhaps it would have been better idea if you had two or three uh, re reports, two or three different meetings. Um, thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, the committee report does have status and it needs to show all of the material considerations and how they are balanced. So we think it's important that members have as much information as, as possible um, in that we do try and keep them as short and succinct as possible and we do try and complement that with a suite of member training to to um, help and support and, and make sure you're you're up to speed on the issues. Chair, I'm not suggesting that we have any sh uh, lesser information. What I'm suggesting that they probably take a block of, of, of the proposal 
and have a detailed consideration that at the next meeting have another block. I'm not su suggesting that, you know, we, we just reduce the size of the report and give members less information. And just, as a matter of fact, I'm proposing the, the, the contrary to that. Your, your point is noted. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, so now we'll move on to um, the first substantive item, um, HGY 2021-1604, which is 10 Fordington Road, N6. Um, and I'd like to ask the Planning Officer, Matt Gunning, to introduce the report, please. Thank you, Chair. This application is for 10 Fordington Road and the application is for the demolition of, of the existing garages and shared. Um, Mr Gunning, I think you're going to have to lean into your mic, oh, sorry. please. Yeah, sorry. Excuse me. It's for the demolition of the existing garages and sheds and the erection of a new dwelling consisting of three floors plus the formation of a basement, as well as a rear garden shed, associated, associated cycle and bin storage, as well as hard and soft landscaping. Uh, this is the site in question. Um, it's a rectangular shaped site. Uh, it is a somewhat unique site in that it, it was laid out in the 1920s to accommodate a dwelling, but it was subsequently used to um, house cars in the form of garages. garages. Uh, it is a deep site, 45 metres deep and 10.6 metres wide. Um, the area is characterised largely by semi-detached and uh, detached properties. Um, some of the housing on the south of the OS map that you can see were developed pre-war, but then the most were developed post-war in the 1920s. Uh, an area perspective then of, of the same, um, showing, as, as described, semi-detached semi detached properties sitting within fairly well landscaped rear gardens. Uh, perspective looking down on, on, this, on the side in question, there's five garages in, in that image. Uh, the two uh, either end are not within the application site, while the three in the middle are. Uh, block plan in the, of the existing site, um, as, as I described, it's a, it's a deep site matching uh, that of, of neighbouring properties. Uh, it backs onto the gardens of two, two to eight on, on the southern boundary. Uh, uh, drawing a perspective of, of the street elevation as is, as, as well as photographs in, in the bottom of the slide. These are then views within the site in question, which members obviously saw on Friday when we, when we went to the site. Uh, you'll see in the top left hand corner, uh, a smaller garage, which also forms part of this site. Um, Fortington Road is characterised by arts and crafts house, houses, largely uh, housing of the 1920s, um, reflective of many properties across the country of the, of the, same, of the same period. Um, so characteristic features include brick, uh, white, white render, uh, steep uh, pitched roofs uh, and use of, of, of bay windows and so on. Uh, there is a variety of different housing types within the street uh, and a variety of gaps. I would say on, on the side um, uh, on which the application side will sit, there's a, there is a fairly consistent pattern of semi-detached properties beyond the, the application side in question. Uh, so looking at the, some of the, the main issues um, set, set, out, set out in the report before you, uh, principle of development, um, obviously um, principle of, of small uh, sites is, is supported by London and national planning policy, um, putting Making the obvious point, it is obviously what historically a site. Uh, it has the, the configuration, the depth, the width, and so on to accommodate a dwelling. Equally, it's in, a, in an accessible location. Uh, it's 18, 18 um, minutes walking distance from Highgate Tube Station, um, somewhat far, but equally, it's relatively close to East Finchley, uh, going via Cherry Tree Wood, Woods, which is located to the north of the site. Uh, design and appearance, uh, as I described, the passion of the, of the area is largely 1920s arts and crafts style housing. Um, the arrangement of plots on corners does vary in, in, the, in the area. Uh, the, de the design access statement submitted with the application um, shows in detail how the scheme res responds to the streetscape, the character and qualities of the area. The front of, of elevation of the building is really, is really a contextual contemporary interpretation of, of the 1920s housing stock. Uh, this is a block plan then showing the proposed um, building uh, sitting in effect in line with 10 and sorry number 12 to, to the north. I would make one exception. There is a single story element to, to the back of the main the main roof form and uh, which projects four meters. Uh, there's also a, a single story building at the back of the garden. 
and you'll also note from that um, drawing uh, one car, park, park, car parking space to the front of the site. Walking you through then the, the various drawings, uh, this is the front elevation. It's largely a, a mirror image of, of 12 in terms of its form. Um, it very much picks up on the, the arts and crafts character of the area. The use of a clay uh, pitch um, roof, um, the castellite roof um, projecting bay, bay wind at the front, um, hip on one side. Uh, this is the rear elevation. You'll note from that drawing there is the basement floor um, below. Uh, side elevation facing the backs of um, 228 Fordington. Um, concerns have been raised by residents about, about this elevation in Pacific, um, specifically appearing bulky, uh, as well as concerns raised about the um, presence of a chimney feature. Uh, just for clarity, the chimney doesn't serve um, for wood burning purposes. It's 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 um, for aiding ventilation within the property. This is then the perspective of the other elevation facing 12, uh, and then cross sections, a cross section, a cross section from the street at, at the top, and then a cross section through the site and the and the bottom. You note, know, as as indicated, there is a garden building at the back of the site as well. Uh, floor plans, uh, basement, basement floor, ground floor. Um, then first and second floors. Um, obviously, the floors get the there is a, dif a difference between the ground and first floor. The ground being deeper with, with the rear with the the rear four meter element. Uh, then the perspective then of the garden building at the back. Uh, these are just two perspectives then of, of the front elevation of the building. One um, showing slightly more brick. Uh, one the latter. Um, in effect, a brick base and, and a render first floor. Uh, a visualization then of, of the of the scheme, um, as, as described, it largely do, does pick up on, on many of the features um, characteristic of, of the area. In terms of impact on the community, as I described, uh, the building lines up um, with number twelve. Um, it's pulled away from from the side of, by, of twelve by virtue of there being a garage next door. On the side next to six and eight, there's a gap providing access to, to, the, to the back of the property. Uh, there's also a garage within the, the garden of, of number eight, as well as associated trees and vegetation, which gives some, some degree of, of um, screening um, to, to, the, to the side of the building. Uh, but notwithstanding, the, the gap between the, the, the new flank wall and the backs of those properties is quite significant. It's um, in it, it's slightly over 20, 25 meters, which is is very generous. In terms of energy, um, the scheme has been submitted uh, has been accompanied by an energy energy report, um, which shows that CO2 emission reductions of 51% will be achieved. This is through um, energy efficiency and energy efficient building fabric, and also by use by 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 the use of appropriate renewable technologies. In this specific case, a uh, ground source heat pump system is to be used. And I also point out that the last remaining CO2 um, emissions uh, will be offset uh, and which will be secured by, by way of a condition. Uh, last issue then is basement development. A basement impact assessment has been submitted with, with the application. Um, the area is not in, in, in an area at risk from flooding or within the critical drainage area. Um, it is known that there are some obviously risks of, of surface, surface water flooding. Uh, within the, the broad area, but not in this, in this immediate area. Um, this has typically been associated with um, historic streams. Um, there are a series of conditions imposed on, on the application in terms of the basement uh, works, uh, obviously to, to get further detail, namely a method statement, uh, the works to be overseen by a structural engineer, as well as hydrological information uh, specific to the site and drainage mitigation. Uh, that's it, Chair. So the application is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any um, questions from the committee, please? Councillor Mitchell. Can I just ask whether the um, proposed property is built up to the boundary with number 12? Uh, yes, in terms of 12, it, it does touch the garage. Any other questions? Oh, Councillor Morris. 
Um, yeah, just on the um, same subject, um, you showed us some photos and there were um, variant gaps between um, the properties and um, I remember that from the site visit. Um, just interested to know why um, it's acceptable to um, build right up to the boundary. Thank you. Uh I think in, in mindful of the context of the area, it is quite varied. Um, but at the same time, I have, we, we accept that the side of, of this side of Fordington has a degree of consistency. Um, I think obviously had this has been, been had this site been developed at the start, you may have had to, um, you may have had a pair of, of semis to start off with. So uh, you are to some extent in, uh, imposing a detached property uh, at the end. But I think notwithstanding the context of, of the of the area is quite, is quite varied. Uh, there's still a, a gap by virtue of there being a garage between uh, 12 and, and this property 10. So uh, I think the design solution does does achieve an acceptable relationship. Uh, I just point out that the the use of a, of a, of a pitch on the side uh, with 12 also um, serves to kind of um, uh, mark that, that gap and separation and provide a, a lot of views of greenery and trees in, in the background. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chair. I didn't quite catch what Mr Guilfoyle said about um, flood risk. Um, I mean, we're, what with global warming and that sort of thing, there's increased um, prevalence of flooding and um, I forgot what my second point was. I'll just clarify, I'm Matthew Gunning, I'm, I'm substituting for my, my colleague, um, colleague of the um, In terms of your, your point about um, flood risk, as, as I mean, indicated, the basement impact assessment was submitted with, with the application. It goes through the, the normal steps, it looks at structural issues, it looks at, at flood risk, whether to the, uh, what the area is prone to, to surface water flooding, um, all types of different types of flooding. Um, the basement impact assessment does obviously look at historic water courses in, in, in the area um, and so on. So it, it does get, give you a good picture of, of what the issues are. Um, uh, in effect, the, the outcome of the basement impact assessment was that at this point, no further investigative works are required, uh, but there are inevitably required to feed into the, the full design of the scheme, inevitably, inevitably to inform um, construction, the type of foundations and so on. Um, so I think from our perspective, the information submitted so far does give safeguards, uh, but we equally recognise that more detail has to be provide, provided as, as a matter of course as this project um, evolves and, and um, is, is designed to in, in full detail. Yeah, we've got a follow up. Yeah. Mr Gunning. I remember what it was. It was um, whether the, the basement part of this application um, would be affected in some way. Uh, I'm not fully sure what you mean by the basement. I mean, normally, I suppose the concern with basement development is, it, is that does it does it present issues for for gardens uh, adjoining? Um, and never to be a basement here, we'll have to uh, include measures to allow water to drain around it, um, which is, is a standard feature with, with basement development. Uh, I know the applicants consultant is here this evening so they can perhaps comment in more detail on, on the, the, the the intended um, design features that they will probably use. Uh, but from our perspective, uh, being a deta detached property, the basement is largely contained below the footprint of the house. It does, we accept, project into the garden, but there is still a high degree of um, permeable, permeable surfacing around the site. There's a quite, quite a deep garden. Uh, so I think in combination, those measures mean that there won't be an adverse effect on on groundwater conditions in the locality. Thanks. And if there are no more questions, then we have um, some people here to speak. You may. Yeah. For page two, there's a list of items running from number one to number 18. And number 16, it says removal of permitted development rights. Why is that? Uh, we're accepting that this is a large house. I mean, as, as I described it, it's, there's a main two-story form um, to, to, the, to, the, to the property, as you can see on the screen. There's also a single-story element, and then there's also a rear garden building. So, in effect, the applicant or whoever the, the future 
all know this property will be, is creating what is a very sizable house uh, in order to obviously safeguard immunity to, to, to neighboring residents and also to make sure that there is uh, acceptable landscaping. There isn't uh, an over concentration of hard surfacing on the site. It's appropriate that we remove permission development rights. Thanks. Um, so we have some, uh, are you okay with that? Yeah. Um, objectors here to speak with us this evening. We have uh, David Inwald and Carmel Sher, who will, I understand you're sharing three minutes, and also Alex and Claire Whitaker, who are also sharing three minutes. Oh, it's just just Alex now. Okay, so who who's first? Uh, okay, Alex. So you have three minutes, and when the three minutes is is up, you will hear the bell from the clock. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. My wife and I are the residents and owners of number 12 Fordington Road, which neighbours the proposed development site. In our written objection, we are clear that we support the principle of a property on the application site, but that the proposed design is of a very poor quality and should therefore be refused permission. It is not in accordance with development plan design policies and is inconsistent with national policy and guidance, the National Planning Policy Framework and National Design Guide. The run of semi-detached buildings along the southeastern edge of Fordington Road are of a distinctive and unified character. This character is achieved through regular roof rhythms and spacing, providing a clear view to the gardens and skyscape beyond. This is a common and defining feature of Fordington Road that gives the street its verdant character and feeling of openness. The proposed development would break this distinct character in two key ways. The first is the out of scale nature of the development. The proposed property would be more than twice the size of neighbouring dwellings on an almost identically sized plot. The proposal for a three-storey structure, two above ground and one below, directly on the shared boundary with number 12 is unprecedented on the street and will eliminate any views from the street through the plot to the gardens and skyscape beyond. The addition of a series of windows directly on the shared boundary with number 12, including a large staircase window, which appears not to conform with building regulations on fire safety, is also unprecedented and could prejudice the scope for future development at number 12. Where properties on the street have added a two storey side extension, such as at number 24, planning has required that these are always set back from the boundary at the second storey and they never have any windows directly on the boundary. By breaking with this convention, the design essentially creates a terracing effect when number 12 becomes a mid terrace property between numbers 10 and 14. The second issue concerns the design itself. The design is in effect half of a semi-detached house, with the appearance of the other half having either been demolished or not yet built. It is a very poor design solution for the site. The design and access statement says the dwelling will provide a full stop to the southeastern edge of Fordington Road. It in fact does the opposite, giving the street a forever unfinished appearance, where the missing other half of the semi will never be built. It is not a dwelling that is of its place, an essential characteristic of high quality design. As I said in my opening remarks, we do not object to the principle of a dwelling on this site and in our written objection, we propose revisions which would still provide for a substantial family home without the negative impact on the streetscape and neighbouring properties. If planning permission is granted in its current form, a precedent is set for oversized building on residential plots in this area, undermining the urban design quality and character of the area to the detriment of the local community and the borough as a whole. I therefore trust that you will refuse permission. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and inside time as well. So over to David and Carmel. Uh, same, same for you. Three minutes, but shared between you both. Thanks. May I just, a, sorry, may I just, may I just ask the question before I start, which yes. is, I didn't know that the uh, site visit had been made by councillors. Is that correct? Yeah, that's. We always um, have site visits before planning committee. Okay, thank you. So I and my wife Carmel live at number eight Fordington. In the first instance, I'd like to say we appreciate the time and effort invested into considering this application from the planning officers and for the opportunity to speak. We've never doubted that a house will eventually be built on this site and we've never disputed the principle of development of a single dwelling. Our contention in our written objection is that the proposed design is not of good quality at all. The elements we continue to most strongly dispute are its design and appearance and the impact on neighbouring amenity. It's our contention and the contention of all our neighbours who commented on the proposal that it's not in accordance with policies alluded to in the report by the planning officers. Out of 35 comments, there were 28 objections and only one in open support. 
One statement of support was subsequently withdrawn. There were 28 objections, including one from the Highgate Society and one from a local councillor. We ask, what is the purpose of consultation in a local democracy where non-elected representatives of the council choose to give no weight to the strength of local feeling here? And these objections focus mainly on design and appearance and amenity impacts and risk of flooding from the basement, all being material considerations and policy matters. Putting the basement to one side, in regard to streetscape and local environment, as Alex has said, the form and mass of the proposed house are excessive for the street and its intrinsic character. It is larger in almost every dimension than the other houses in that row of houses. And the aesthetic from the street is unsightly and bizarre, giving the appearance of a semi-detached house sliced in two. We think there is a major impact on our home amenity and the street's character due to the side elevation which set faces the rear of our house and is clearly visible from the street. This is caused by the gabled bookend design and the scale, bulk and mass of the proposed dwelling. We'll be, spacing, we'll be facing an expanse of overbearing and imposing wall, which will blot out a chunk of sky, ruin our aspect and make our garden feel very enclosed. There are some pictures on the rear of the document that I've circulated to the councillors, which may be useful to look at here. We've previously suggested a redesign to revise the gable end and to reduce the bulk of the property, resulting in a smaller freestanding house with a pitched roof facing our house at number eight. With these scheme amendments, we would support the granting of planning permission. Because these amendments have not been made, we consider the proposal should now be refused on the basis of it not being in accordance with the development plan policies alluded to by Alex. All of these are important considerations in the design that need to be given a proper weight. Finally, we note that the planning officers have sought to limit the freedom of the, freedom of the committee to decide against this proposal by engaging the national policy planning framework, which also requires local planning authorities to significantly boost the supply of housing. Our view is that this is not relevant to our objection, as we do accept that a house will eventually be built on this site. Thank you for listening. We'd just like to conclude that we do not object to a house being built on this plot, but we do object to this particular house being built. Please respect the strength of local feeling here, as it is based on material considerations that carry very significant weight and support our suggestion to refuse the proposal pending resubmission of an appropriate high quality design. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you I don't think you heard the bell. It's quite a long way away from you, but you finished shortly after that. So oh, sorry. Thanks for that. I didn't hear Thanks for that. Um, do members of the committee have any comments or questions for, for the objectors? I think I'd like to ask for an officer to respond on the policy compliance, um, safety um, of the stairwell uh, window um, and whether it complies with building regs as well. I can just come in there, Chair, on the building control and building regulations. So building regulations are largely a separate regulatory regime to planning, which is what we're considering tonight. Um, nevertheless, um, building control is mentioned in the report um, in paragraph 4.1. Building control states no objection subject to conditions. And in paragraph 6.75, the basement impact assessment has been reviewed by the council's building control service, which raises no objection. Thank you. Um, Councillor Corley Harrison. Um, this question to, I think it was Alex, the first objector. Um, the mention of the windows that are on the um, party wall number 12 that you raised, are your concerns related solely to building control or are they related to, to privacy or, or light restrictions? I didn't quite pick up on that, thanks. Uh, three points of concern related to the windows. One is privacy. They border directly onto our plot, uh, so onto our property. The second is that it prejudices future development at number 12. If you visited the street, you will have seen that it is common for a num number of the houses to have extended above their garages, not the full width of the plot, uh, normally a metre back on the second storey. We believe that if these windows are put into the property on number 12, should we or any future owners of our property wish to make the same alterations that many others have done, those would be denied because there would be windows there. 
And on the point of building regulations, I'm clearly not as well qualified. My read of building regulation B4 11.11 .11 requires that unprotected areas on a boundary and an unprotected area as a window are no more than one square meter, and that a maximum of 4% of, uh, of the area uh, can be unprotected. Clearly, a staircase window is more than one square meter. I'm only saying that to clarify the comment. I couldn't fit that into my three minutes, um, but uh, um, I clearly do not have the qualifications that uh, uh, the planning officer does. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Could I, could I then ask officers, it is quite unusual to have this number of win windows on a boundary wall, so um, why has that been deemed acceptable in this case? Well, there's typically a design solution that can be achieved in terms of building regulations. Uh, in, in order to obviously protect um, the privacy of, of adjoining residents, uh, we have imposed a condition requiring that those windows be fixed shut uh, beyond the point of 1.7 metres uh, in, in height. Um, in respect of any trespass from a window opening, equally that's an issue that would have to be resolved with the affected party. Um, so I, I, I accept that um, the opening of those windows onto, onto the side, onto, onto space that's owned by 12, is an issue that will, will need to be resolved by, by, by way of party wall agreements and so on. It's, I, we accept it's, it's not a, an ideal situation, uh, but it, it is at times a, a common uh, arrangement. Um, I respect um, what's been said by, by the residents in terms of their interpretation of the gaps and, and spacing between these properties. Uh, notwithstanding the siting of this building up to the boundary, we view uh, that the arrangement is still acceptable. Uh, I think a slightly narrower house would perhaps wouldn't inevitably um, pick up on, on the characteristics of, of, of neighbouring properties. It would somewhat be squashed. Um, the portion is not, not correct. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's a, a decision that needs to be balanced, really. Um, yes, if it was off the boundary, it, could, it would address the concern raised, but equally it would have a... Um, it would manifest manifest itself in, in, in other issues, other issues, namely in design terms. Thank you. Any further questions from any members? Oh, yes, sorry, uh, Councillor Morris. Yeah. Sorry, it's quite hard to hear with the mic. So, um, if I missed um, some of the points, one of the points you made, um, Matthew, I'm sorry. Um, but is there any reason why we can't put obscured glass into those windows? That's uh, my first question. Um, and then I've got a question for the objectors. Uh, yes, the condition does require them to be obscured less as well, as well as be fixed shot uh, up to a certain point. Um, but yes, they will be obscured less as well. And your question for the objectors? Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll ask the second set of objectors. Um, I and mean, I think both um, sets of objectors um, um, have make um, their points about the um, the design of the house, and um, I mean, it looks to me as if the um, the overall the sort of concept of the house kind of fits the street. It has that sort of 1930s um, feel to it. Um, is is the biggest problem the fact that it looks as if it's been chopped in half and is missing the other half. If it could look like a, a finished single unit, then you would have um, far less issues with it. Yeah, shall I answer that question? I mean, I think um, that's one major issue, I think, is the, the gable bookend design with that kind of half the semi-detached house look. It looks extremely bizarre. Um, I think that the points have been made about uh, sort of lines of sight through by Alex are also relevant. Um, I think in you know, yes, the, the front of it does look like uh, it has an arts and crafts feel, but in actual fact, this is a very large property, um, and I'm not aware of any arts and crafts properties with large, uh, with you know, basements extending the way this basement extends and uh, rear extensions and so on. So I think it's, you know, from the street, I think it could be uh, uh, improved by by adjusting it as we've suggested, and and that and and that would also. Uh, impact on our amenity at number eight. Thanks. And if there's um, no further questions, I think we'll go over to the applicant. You have six minutes um, to respond to what you've heard this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
Paul and my wife and I have lived in Fordington Road for 43 years and uh, brought our family up there. We like it. Um, we want to stay. We have no plans to move. And we are very sympathetic with the objectors who live either side of our site. Um, I guess we differ from them on the aesthetic point. There are many different points of view possible on what is or is not architecturally acceptable. Um, we are comfortable with the, uh, the look of the house in the streetscape. We are comfortable that it will not cause any structural damage to our neighbours and it brings no risk of flooding to the area. More of that in a, in a moment or two. We, uh, a year ago, we had a meeting with um, the Director of Development in Haringey, Dean Hermitage, a Planning Officer, Connor, Connor Gilfoyle, and Urban Design Officer, Shamizo Unaki, Unaka, um, with preliminary plans for this house. It was a pre-application meeting, which I'm sure members are familiar with. The report from that meeting gave us clear guidance on how we should shape our application in order to make it more acceptable uh, for uh, having a planning policy and hopefully improve our chances of accept acceptance at this meeting. The um, report covered all the major areas uh, of the design and all the areas where objectors already made points. So first of all, the size and the footprint of the house and its placement on the plot. We talk about building up to the boundary with number 12. I should point out to members that our existing garage, which was built in 1922, was built before the garage on number 12, which was built in 1949. The garage on number 12 um, did not follow its planning approval design and in fact abuts directly already on our garage. So we in effect already have an abutting pair of buildings here and our proposal was to follow the building line of the existing 1922 garage. We had guidance from the pre-app meeting that that was acceptable. Um, there's been some discussion of gaps between buildings. Uh, I walked around Fordington Road yesterday and I picked up at least 10 pairs of houses where the visual gap between the house was less than the gap between our planned building on number 10 and number 12. So around Fordington Road, there's a lot of variation is, is the truth and we don't believe that we will be out of line with um, what is proposed. The pre-app meeting steered us in the direction of a hipped roof towards number 12 and the gable towards number eight. And that's picked up again in the planning officer's report. We had very specific guidance on the side windows and they will be obscured, they will be uh, fire rated and in fact, if you look around Fordington Road, there are many double story uh, windows inside of houses on the stairwell. So we're absolutely consistent with designs around Fordington Road. And all the other points, the major points of design, we followed from the pre-application meeting. Our basement proposals attracted um, widespread interest, I would say. So I'd now like to introduce our basement consultant to say a few words about that before I close. Morwenna Corrie. Hi, as John explained, I'm a chartered geologist working for Luster Consulting and wrote the basement impact assessment for the site. We have extensive experience in writing basement impact assessments for London councils, including Haringey. And in addition, we also act as an independent third party reviewer of BIAs for Lambeth Council. The BIA was submitted in line with the pre-application advice from Haringey Council and follows the London Borough of Camden's guidance. 
This is generally considered to be the gold standard for basement impact assessment requirements and has since been adopted with relevant changes by other London boroughs. Intrusive works will be carried out to develop a site specific ground model relating to the underlying geological and hydrological conditions. This will include a ground movement assessment of the underlying clay to ensure appropriate measures during construction, for instance, including protection measures to mitigate against heave. Due to the underlying clay, puddling currently occurs within the soft landscaping at the site. This dissipates without any intervention. It is therefore considered that the implementation of, implementation of a formal drainage regime will improve the occurrences of puddling at the site. The proposed drainage regime has been assessed by Thames Water using the sequential approach to the disposal of surface water in line with the 2021 London plan. Thames Water have raised no objections to this development. You it, can't hear it, but that's the, um, the bell's gone off. Um, so that's time's Sorry. up. Sorry. Thanks. And maybe we need to hold the bell to the microphone or something. Um, do we have any... Is this feeding bell? Do you have any questions? Yeah, I see Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think everyone accepts that there would have been a house built on this site 100 years ago. Even the, the numbering of the houses indicate that it would have been a house there. Um, and something that the applicant said that, that um, he differs uh, on the aesthetics of the building. Um, and Councillor Morris said, it, why, why design a house that looks like half a house has been built? So that's my question to the applicant. And I know you did mention that planning officers sort of steered you in that direction, but, but why build a house that looks like half a house? Well, yes, it, it's true that we had very clear guidance from the pre-application meeting. Uh, the phrase was a gable end would make um, an ideal termination to that row of houses. Uh, if you look around Fordington Road, there are at least eight other gable ends on the sides of houses in a similar position. Number, number um, 47, for example, is at the end of the row of Fornington Road houses that ends just before Cherry Wood. That has a gable end. Uh, a, another house further up the road, number 51, has in fact a double gable similar to ours. So we felt that given the huge variety of styles in Fordington Road, underlying underlying 1920s and 30s and, and arts and crafts, but nevertheless, uh, a lot of variation on the details. We felt that given the guidance from the um, pre app meeting chaired by the head of development, that was a reasonable line to follow. Thanks. I don't know if it might be helpful to the committee if I asked our design officer, Richard Truscott, to come in on, on this, please. Thank you. Yes, um, as, as the applicant said, I wasn't involved in this application, but my colleague Shamiso, erstwhile colleague Shamiso, um, was uh, attended the pre-app, and I've since communicated with her about the, the, the this application notes coming to the committee. And as she pointed out, uh, this was considered to be the the, the best solution um, to have like a half of a semi-detached house here. Um, the crucially the hipped roof that mirrors the hipped roof of the house to the northeast of the site and the rest of the terrace so that it will appear to be part of the of the row of semi-detached houses albeit that it'll appear to be a, a half of a, of, of a semi-detached pair um, so it'll have the crucial close relationship to the neighbors to the northeast it also means that the roof profile will match the rest of the terrace. It won't have to have a steeper pitch or a, or a, a, a different sort of roof profile. It'll have a lot, something that's very much in keeping. And then the, um, I mean, I think that the gable end is relatively harmless to the neighbours. Um, the, 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 the neighbours whose long back gardens will back onto this um, gable end are 
the, the houses are quite a long way away from those houses. Um, they're quite well screened and they're higher up on the slope and they're all crucially to the southwest, so they won't lose any sunlight. Uh, they'll lose very, very little daylight. It won't have any material effect on the house and very, very minuscule material effect on those neighbouring gardens. All there'll be is a mostly blank, um, but in visually interesting gable with that striking sculptural chimney um, and the pair of gables with the area of pitch roof between. Uh, it could look quite an interesting um, gable end. It doesn't have to, this isn't a precious conservation area. It's a nice but mixed area with, an all, with quite a range of different houses in the area. And this will be an, in, this if permitted and, as currently, and built as currently proposed, will be an interesting variation, an interesting take on the dominant semi-detached form um, that won't look out of place. It'll look interesting, but of, of the same family of the area. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the committee? Um, so the recommendation is to grant with the, um, what's the full recommendation, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, recommendation is to grant uh, subject to conditions. So can I see, please, um, I should point out at this point, uh, Councillor Ibrahim, as you weren't here for the whole item, you'll be unable to vote on this item. Um, so all those um, in favour of this recommendation to grant planning permission, please show now. And all those against? And any abstentions? I don't think. So that um, permission is granted. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. So as discussed, we're going to go um, on now to the, the pre-application uh, 2021-0026, Florentina, no, Florentia, that's a type of pizza, isn't it? Um, Clothing Village Storage Park, Vale Road. And I believe we have a virtual presentation on this. Yeah, Yes, Toby, are you ready? I am. You didn't. Bear with me. When you're ready, Mr. Finlayson. Can everyone see the location map? You hear me, Robbie? Robbie? Can anyone hear me? Toby, we can't hear you. Do you want to share the presentation? I could quickly introduce the site. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just very quickly, the, the application site um, shown in red there um, within an industrial area um, in the Harangay Warehouse District. And um, the application is for new blocks of light industrial floor space. Next slide, Toby, if you have one. I think best we just hand over to the applicant team to um, to go through the presentation. Thank you. Robbie, can you hear me now? Do you mind introducing yourselves, please? Yes, thank Thanks. you. We'll do. Um, I've just popped the presentation up on the screens, and hopefully, uh, some of you will have hard copies. Uh, my name is Tom Horn. I'm from DP9. We're planning consultants acting on the scheme. Uh, I'm here with uh, Jacob Sanderson from uh, our client, General Projects, and Carl Turner from Turner Works, uh, the architects. Um, we will set our timer to make sure that we stay well within time. 
Um, I'll quickly start us off by saying that um, we've been working um, with officers over a number of months. Uh, we've had several pre-application meetings. Um, we've had a public consultation meeting uh, on the site and we are moving quite quickly towards a submission. So we're here to present to you tonight where we've got up to in our proposals. And I'll hand you over to Jacob to take us through a bit more on the client side and Carl will take us through the proposals. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good, good, good evening. Uh, Jacob Sandelson from General Projects. Um, just briefly to introduce us, we are a creative-led um, urban mixed-use uh, real estate developer focused on bringing forward campuses primarily for SME maker manufacturing and light industrial uh, businesses uh, in very similar locations to uh, the target site, uh, Florentia Clothing Village, uh, which sits in the Harangi Warehousing District. Um, before we unpack the site and explain our proposals too much, I wanted to make reference to a of another project which we have recently de delivered in the London Borough of Newham, uh, which is now home to 162 local SME businesses and supports over 900 jobs. Um, the campus was designed in such a way that it provided publicly accessible, whilst useful, um, kind of co-working and breakout space areas, uh, which are now used daily by members of the general public, but also accessible as event space to support a substantial community wealth building program that we run in partnership with the London Borough of Newham, responding to uh, uh, as effectively a skills deficit in the local area, which again supports a, a kind of a positive upskilling that takes place at the site and in turn supports the overall success of the campus as a hub for SMEs and local jobs. Thanks, Jacob. I'm Carl Turner, Director of Turner Works. Uh, I'm an architect specialising really in startup and incubator spaces. I was also the founder of Pop Brixton and Peckham Levels, which are again kind of community focused startup spaces. So we've got great synergy on the team and skills in delivering this type of campus. Great. Thanks, Carl. Just to introduce the site. So we General Projects purchased what is effectively or what we consider to be two separate sites earlier this year. On the left hand side of the screen, or if you're looking at the pack um, on page five, um, apologies, page six, uh, you can see the, Flore the existing Florentia clothing village, uh, which is also broken out in further detail on page eight. Uh, the existing Florentia clothing village uh, is home to 130 existing jobs and 34 small and medium sized businesses and contributes in excess of six and a half million pounds of GVA to the local area. So for all intents and purposes is a fantastic success supporting lots of small, creative, interesting businesses. To the right hand side of the image, uh, you can see a one and a half acre storage for what we call the storage for London site which is effectively an undeveloped brownfield site, which acts in our view as somewhat of a blight on Vale Road, uh, which is the road which you can see uh, two sides fronting on. Um, and that is the application site, which we're hopefully going to be bringing forward proposals uh, on later this year, following talking to you this evening. Thanks, Jacob. And yeah, as you can see, the site is, is a fairly um, blank space in Vale Road at the moment. Um, it's, it's fenced off and it's used for storage but doesn't really activate the street very well um, whereas I think if you flick onto the next side the existing village they've done a great job of really creating a unique place in the middle of the Haringey warehouse district that we really hope to to build on the success of this um, really great um, initiatives next slide so yeah we're really excited about the opportunity to extend the clothing village uh, to create roughly a hundred thousand square feet of additional space um, uh, 58 new business units we think it will create over 250 new jobs. Um, we're targeting Briam Excellent. And I think Jacob's also going to talk about the community wealth building aspects of the scheme. So it's a, re a really unique uh, way of delivering SME spaces, I think. And we're really looking forward to taking you through the proposals. Next slide. So yeah, just a little bit about the architecture. We're working uh, really between the scale of the Maynard Suite Factory and the existing Florencia Village. So the Maynard Factory on the right, Village on the left, and we're really playing on that industrial language of the Haringey Warehouse District, uh, but trying to kind of refresh it. We're trying to create a new um, pedestrian entrance and a separate um, main vehicle entrance and really use 
the landscaping to tie the sites together. We also really want to activate that Vale Road um, space because it, it is quite it is quite dead at the moment. Lots of the consultation feedback that we've had as people slightly wary about walking down that street at night. And we really think it will help to activate that street. So next slide, please. So this is a view from inside the new part of the campus from one of the upper levels. Um, and it's all about creating a, a really great mix of new spaces uh, for startup businesses. So building on the, the kind of mid mid range scale of the existing spaces with small units on the upper floors and some larger units on the on the lower levels uh, in a really uh, new uh, mix of vibrant uh, public space. So next slide, please. So this just gives an overview, the, the old and the new, how it will create a really significant new heart at the center of the Haringey Warehouse district and hopefully tie in with lots of the other really vibrant uh, things that are going on in the warehouse district at the moment. So next slide, please. So yeah, just a little bit about connections, again, through the consultation um, and also through DRP and other people we've spoken to, this idea of actually using the site, which is currently quite a block in the area from movement, particularly north-south, and really trying to, through conversations with other local um, landowners, think about how we can open up and activate these routes. So next slide. So yeah, at a kind of granular level, um, we're working with the kind of laneway typology that we find in Florencia Village at the moment. So this is the small connection piece between the two spaces uh, using a new site kind of hub and office to activate the street, but creating a really safe pedestrian entrance for all of the existing and new tenants and, and members of the village. Next slide, please. Then just thinking about how we can zoom out and think about this as a new core for the area and how we can create routes through tying in green spaces, the estate of Tiverton Road, Overbury Road, and really, you know, we're pushing really hard, talking to existing neighbours about how we can use this to really tie in all of these other neighbours. So next slide. Over to you, Jacob. So in considering, uh, in considering our brief for Carl and how to bring forward a proposal here, we've looked at what has worked and what hasn't worked within the existing Florentia village, but also drawn on our experience from running similar campuses such as Expressway in Newham. Um, and it ultimately comes down to the needs of these types of users is so diverse depending on really A, what they do from coffee roasters and craft brewers who have really, really distinct and kind of specialized fit out requirements through to kind of artists and more kind of desk type users who actually just want somewhere to arrive and take space flexibly and so uh, next slide please tom we've really looked to deliver a wide range of spaces within the overall campus both within the proposed application this evening and what we already offer at the existing sorrentia campus to support and incubate local businesses across a different mix of sizes and use types by doing so, this really fosters and grows and incubates local supply chains um, and hopefully retains slightly larger businesses within the local area for the long term, in turn supporting newer businesses uh, jo jo joining and signing up. So yeah, we talked already about the uh, the new spaces um, and while the, spa while the site is private, we're going to create a whole <coughs> series of new routes through it, really trying to welcome in and, you know, we talked to lots of local people about creating shortcuts through. We really want the campus to be open, so it will be ungated. There'll be three new spaces, two uh, within the new site, and one will be an enhancement of the courtyard that exists in, in the existing site. Um, so next slide, please. So this is a zoom into that central courtyard area, looking back towards the existing Florencia village. There's quite a nice uh, level change between the two sites. So we're going to create some tiered seating there trees, greenery, and obviously it's a balance between a hard-working industrial landscape, but trying to actually green it, use permeable surfaces where possible, and really try and create a sense of community, not just the people that work here, but actually how we can pull in the local community as well. So next slide, please. So one of those spaces will be the community courtyard, which we'll come on and talk a bit about more um, later. So next slide. So just a little bit about sustainability. We realise we're in the middle of, uh, you know, a challenging climate crisis times. Uh, this is a, a lightweight industrial campus for startup businesses. So we're trying to strike a balance between um, pushing this typology as far as we can. So we're targeting Briam Excellent, which is above what we need to. <clears throat> but as a sort of panel of uh, applicants, we're really committed to that. We're also going to have a net 
gain in biodiversity and we're targeting net zero carbon for the whole development and there's a whole plethora of things that we'll be doing we're having to work really hard to move this typology on so next slide please so yeah we, we've um, through a series of design iteration we're looking at how to orientate the buildings as best we can to create a huge amount of south-facing roofs for power generation we've got sustainable drainage uh, the buildings will be largely kind of fabricated off-site using standardized components so that we can effectively think about the lifetime cycle of the building, about how we can dismantle them and repair bits in the future. They'll be naturally ventilated and a whole plethora of other things from, you know, energy saving devices to low water usage. Next slide, please. And this is just a little bit about the landscape, about how we're thinking about the new the new part and the and the existing part of the campus and how we can use these kind of soft and hard landscapes to try and tie the two parts of the site together. These three spaces, uh, there's an upper courtyard, the central courtyard, and then the existing courtyard that we're really looking to turbocharge. So next slide, please. And we're working with landscape consultants. And I think all I'll say about this is we're looking at really high quality public realm design here. So next slide. And just, just an overview of transport, it's definitely targeting local people, cycle usage, uh, pedestrians. So we're providing way in excess of what we need to in terms of cycle parking. We're also for this type of, uh, I guess, industrial building, providing uh, centralized shower blocks for, for users, which is really unusual. So we're really trying to push the kind of like non-car user agenda, which is, you know, against this typology in many ways, but we're really pushing that. Next slide. Over to you, Jenko. So just to talk a little bit more about how we try and overlay and kind of an operating strategy that really works with the local community and works with the local needs in a sense um, in response to effectively what we're proposing to deliver on the site. Um, we've looked to really incorporate a kind of a good economy plan into the design by the delivery of these free purpose-built publicly accessible yards and by opening up the scheme to the public at, at large. Um, by doing that, that will enable us spaces to deliver a wider community wealth building or good economy program that will respond to a number of key local needs that we've identified through consultation with various stakeholders. Um, those are being developed at, a, at the moment, but at a high level, that will involve a skills and training program that will run with our occupier businesses to educate them on the benefits of taking on apprenticeships to inform them on how to hire and procure locally and in turn that will incubate and further foster local supply chains therefore making the scheme truly self-fulfilling so far as these schemes ultimately work best when our businesses procure from within the scheme or within the immediate area and in turn looking to actually leverage that incumbent body of skills by virtue of the fact that there's going to be almost 100 small and medium sized businesses working in this campus once it's delivered and then partnering with local schools and lo other, other local groups to actually really educate local people on you know these are these are businesses providing jobs around the corner from where they live and actually helping people to access those jobs and in turn fostering kind of upward social mobility within the local area. In, in aggregate, based on our, our current work that we're developing in partnership with PRD, who we also delivered our community wealth building strategy with in Newham, we're expecting that that will result in, in excess of a million pounds of social value delivered within the local area. For clarity, social value is uh, effectively the, the sum cost of the value of the projects that we would be delivering, such as a youth mentoring program or an apprenticeship partnership. Um, similarly, all said and done, we're expecting that the proposed extension will deliver 58 new uh, business spaces for a mix of different business sizes and in excess of 250 new jobs for the local area, which will result in 13 million pounds of GVA uh, for LBH. Um, in terms of community engagement so far, we've flyered in excess of 4,000 local residents uh, holding two days worth of public uh, exhibitions. Um, and in terms of the feedback for on, a, on an aggregate basis, that's 85% of people have said that they support the proposals. Uh, but the key feedback on a more qualitative basis that we've had has been actually the fact that we're really curing a bit of a blight on Vale Road by opening up the campus and by 
kind of effectively safeguarding and activating that piece of streetscape. Uh, similarly, the other positive feedback we've had is that we're providing kind of much needed local amenity by way of the co-working space and by way of kind of smaller business starter units, uh, which a number of different uh, people who engaged with us uh, actually recommended Thanks. people for. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. You were timed out, but again, can't, can't really hear the bell from there. Um, do we have any questions, comments? Um, I've got Councillor Peacock waiting and then Councillor Corey Harrison. Okay. Good evening. I, I know this building very, very well. I've been there many, many times as a personal friend of the original owner, and he used to proudly call it a village, not a campus, and it was named after his wife who sadly had passed away. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you know that he was a Greek Cypriot. And I visited it many times in my capacity as chair of Haringey and Bloom, because all the little um, shops and businesses that were there used to have lots of floral displays. And so uh, many years they used to actually win elections. I, I'm a bit disturbed that you keep on calling it a campus and that really, really irritates me. It really, really does, because his concept was a village and also the entrance was Art Deco and he used to proudly show me the staircase and the entrance to the building is Art Deco. And we used to have um, uh, meals in the restaurant, which led onto the road, which passers-by could also use. And Michael, who was the manager at the time, took me upstairs and he showed me all the workshops that they were creating to train people in the art of pattern cutting and all the various uh, things of tailoring. In fact, one of his um, people then set up a, her own factory in Hermitage Road, and it is a great success from the training that she received at the Florentia Village. So please stop calling it a campus, call it a village, return to what um, the original concept was, which was a group of all people working together, having space and working and socializing together, which was really, really a very nice atmosphere. Thank you very much, Councillor, for your feedback. Firstly, enti entirely acknowledged in terms of uh, the village, uh, so th th thank you for that. Um, in terms of the Florentia name, uh, se secondly, we have contractually committed to retaining the Florentia name, and as you touched on, the, the ethos and spirit of the overall existing village is ultimately what we're looking to invest in and expand on with the proposals coming forward. Uh, so in, in, in spirit and in your feedback, I think actually we're very much on the same page, uh, but apologies for the misuse of the word campus. Thank you. Thanks. I've got Councillor Corley Harrison, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, Given the, given the area and the location, I have to say I'm slightly disappointed with the designs that you brought forward. I know they're in quite early stages if it's still pre-app, I, I would have thought. But other than the surface treatment, if you were to take that away, it largely looks like you're trying to rebuild warehouses that you've then converted into some form of workshop space in a kind of pastiche way uh, out of corrugated... I mean, it looks like this roof of this sports hall. And I think that there's a real opportunity here for this to be a really sort of, well, ideally world class design in the heart of what is already quite a creative space undergoing some quite significant changes over the coming years if other applications are to come forward. And <clears throat> I know design is subjective. My view is, as one member of this panel would be to go away and do something really, really interesting, really, really out there, really modern, not just try to recreate something that actually wasn't really there. Because if you look around, it's all brick built. It, it's not this corrugated iron clad, clad buildings. I like the surface treatments. I, I, I do like the communal space, but like I say, if you were to take those away, if the painting weren't there, this would really look like a HGV lorry depot uh, in all intents and purposes. And, and so I, I, I would, you know, that, that, I think that top graphic really does sum it up, other than the fact it blends into the sky completely. You've got a beautiful warehouse building next door. Um, and for me, this doesn't really offer much. And there's a real opportunity here. It's not a conservation area or anything like that, as far as I'm aware. Um, so that, that's my view on it. It's not a question. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Ibrahim. 
Yeah, so I'm really glad Councillor Peacock very, very strongly pointed out because it was... Um, so the, the reason... I'm Well, because of its historic connection with the Cypriot community, um, that's why I would assume it has the, the, the title village in it. And it does need... Um, I mean, for me, what's important about this site is its historic link with... The, the North London Cypria um, rag trade, and um, you know I'm going through your um, your your booklet, and you know that there, there, there is a kind of you know there, there there is a page on there which shows the full character of of, of and the image and and the image that that I'm assuming the original um, the the original people who opened the site intended for it. Um, which is why I absolutely agree with you, Sheila. That, that what was it, that the term campus was really, really grating on me, actually. And uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't reflect the um, the the kind of idea of what of what for many that site is. You know, um, I'd kind of want to hear a little bit more about what you would be doing to to retain some of that heritage and that character and that association with the site um, because obviously I'd, I'd be interested in whether you were looking to attract um, kind of more interest from the fashion industry because that's that's precisely what the site is historically associated with it's got a you know a, a very close place in many um, kind of residents that still live in this borough in their hearts in terms of the historic connection with Haringey and clothing production North London and clothing production I fully understand that it's you know my own family are, are, are from that background and you know you know I grew up in the rag trade and I'd really really like to see something a bit kind of you know appreciative of that and looking to attract that Look, the, 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 the fashion industry has changed so over the last 20, 25 years. A lot of production is abroad, but there is there is an opportunity to kind of, you know, um, appreciate the fact that this site is historically linked with um, the, the, the local um, Cypriot economy and historically with, with, with the rag trade. So uh, I... Again, I completely agree with Councillor Corley Harrison. I mean, you know, it it doesn't it doesn't feel like um, too much thought has gone yet into appreciating the heritage. It may it may not be conservation area, but if you look at the character of it, it's it's okay. quite clear what the intent was for it to look like a village, a Thanks. Cypriot village. Thanks, Councillor Ibrahim. Um, before you come back in, I'll just see if we've got any other questions, comments. If not, uh, would you like to respond to those points? That, 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 sorry, can you hear me? Th thank you for your feedback. Again, um, in incredibly valid and helpful. I think to touch on specifically the existing Florentia village, we all very much agree in spirit and if that hasn't been relayed in, in in the presentation i think that's more down to presentation than it is down to thought process uh, just to explain a little bit more about how we look at op op operating uh, op operating the existing village beyond actually our proposals for the new these the, these places in Sorrentia especially works best when people working within the existing village then refer other people to come and work there because what it builds is a sustainable and organically generated community that's absolutely the founding ethos of our entire operating strategy and how we look to run these places and this this village so in terms of a process for our kind of design thinking the first thing we did upon purchasing the village from the yani family was we actually invited all of the existing occupiers for a drink in the central courtyard. The thinking there was actually how can we how can we build on what's already here and respond to that positively and what's needed and green spaces, pedestrian spaces, but equally working spaces and getting that mix right was the feedback we received. 
um, and effectively looking to build on that and build on that incumbent skill set through our community wealth building proposals is very much for the logic and thinking in the proposals this evening uh, but clearly that wasn't fully fully conveyed thanks yeah if i can just say a little bit as well about the design i think the existing village uh, we, we all love it that's why we're really excited about the project uh, and we've all spent time down there and i think it's just fair to say that it it wasn't designed as such it's actually a series of buildings that have emerged over the years and then the previous owners have obviously lavished care and attention on it and you know they've planted green walls they've used color in a really imaginative way they've used kind of place names so all of those things are things that we will be trying to pull through to the existing uh, to the to the new part you know more planting um using color we're using colored window frames and metal work we'll be using the same language I, I would just say that the the buildings that we're building um, are <clears throat> are going to be much higher performing. So obviously we don't build buildings the way we used to. Uh, they need to be really highly insulated and have a lot of other technical stuff going on that the old buildings that we've inherited that actually do need a lot of TLC and there will be separate work and applications coming forward to enhance what's already there in terms of bringing those buildings, which, you know, we were doing the consultation in one a few days ago and it was freezing cold in there. You know, it's they're not really insulated, they're, they're poorly heated. So actually there is there is kind of a refresh that's needed across the existing site. Um, so we're trying to reflect the kind of industrial nature of the wider Haringey Warehouse District. You know, maybe I'm sure we haven't quite nailed it yet. You know, this is uh, in progress. I think uh, it'd be, you know, I think I think in terms of the overall scale and massing, we've largely got three-storey buildings that we're bringing forward, and the existing village is a mix of like two to four storeys. Um, so we're, we're showing more particular ele elevation here. Maybe we need to show some more views, uh, showing how the existing village will connect through into the proposal. I think we've largely focused. Sorry, the because it's a short presentation today. We just focused on the new bit and not really kind of talk too much about the existing village but we we definitely see it um you know growing from the existing village um enhancing it and we're probably not there yet um but we also know there's a massive need for this type of space in the area and we're at the consultation we met lots of people who actually said great when's the space going to be ready how do i sign up for it so we've also been talking to council officers who've already started identifying uh, other groups and, and manufacturers in the area who are under pressure, some in the clothing industry that would be ideal for these buildings. So we, we think there's a great need for it. Um, the people that are in the existing village seem to be like on the large, like really supportive of what we're trying to do. So I just wanted to reassure you that we're, we're listening to what you say and we'll, we'll, um, we'll go away and have another think. Councillor Ibrahim. Yes, thank you. And I and I and I, I just don't want to. I, I want to over, not overstress the point about kind of making sure that there is some recognition of the kind of you know history of the site and the heritage. And I think that's really important. I mean, yep, you know, you you talked about how you know people have lavished. They, they actually the Lord Carradon Square it's because he was the last governor of Cyprus and involved in independence of the island so that's why it's got that name so it's clearly uh, um, the, the, the references the reference points are there so I don't want to overstate that point but I will <laughs> thanks and thank you for coming in today and presenting to us thanks Shia. Shia. Yes. Can we have a short comfort break before we proceed to the big item? Um, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, Thanks. But can we keep it as short as possible? So <laughs> five, five minutes tops. Um, so a little break for everybody, five minutes.
Oh. My item is about to start in five minutes. Oh, man, it's bad, man. Yeah. I'll put it off anyway, it's that or nothing.
streaming any audio currently. Uh, just a quick announcement from the clerk. Um, could uh, do you just mind turning that off? Thank you. Um, could everyone in the meeting make sure not to mute uh, LBO, LBOH guest because they're providing the sound? Thank you. Um, and I might just check with someone in the meeting uh, how much the virtual meeting, how much you've missed of the discussion, uh, and if the planning officer should resume from the beginning. I'll just get that answer. It'll be one moment. <laughs> Shall I continue from where I am, Chair? I was waiting to hear from the clerk. Just a sec. If anyone in the virtual meeting would be able to just confirm briefly in the chat, that would be very helpful. Thank you. They've missed the intro, so it's hard. Chair, could you tell us what's going on? Yeah, what's going on is uh, somebody muted the live stream so people who are watching virtually couldn't hear any of the presentation. So I think we need to start it at the top. Sorry about that, people in the room. Yes, Councillor Ibrahim. Sorry, I just wanted to ask the clerk a quick question as well, if that's OK. It's um, an unusual request. Go on. Yeah, sorry, it's because I arrived late. Yes. Ask, you can ask the clerk a question, yes. You talking to me? So I've got I've got an addendum here um, which relates to um, I'm presuming it relates to this item. Yes, I believe it does, but that might be best answered by a planning officer. Actually. Okay. So so I, I tell you what, hold that thought if it's not for the clerk. If we can get on with the presentation and then when we come to questions, you can ask about that. Well, it's just regarding a, a, a declaration of um, interest. Oh, you missed the declaration of interest yes, at the beginning of the meeting. Yes, because I wasn't here at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, so normally, obviously, because of the addendum and what's in there, just like to... Um, declare that I'm an Arsenal season ticket holder and a member of IESA. OK, thanks for that. So if you want to... Can, can I ask a quick question? Um, can I just check, are you declaring that you will... Are you considering the issue with an open mind and still participating? Absolutely, but it's something that I always declare with regard to those items um, thanks. previously. Thanks. So Based on previous advice. Thanks. So... Mr. Harrington, sorry for the hiccup so far, but if you can sure. start again, thank you. Um, so Graham Harrington, I'm the planning case officer for this application. Just to update the committee that since the addendum report was published, we have had a late comment from the London Borough of Waltham Forest that offers its support to the current layout and massing and heights, but asks that a construction holistics logistics plan be reserved by condition. Here is the formal description of the proposal. It's a, it's a residential less mixed use scheme. In terms of unpacking the main elements of the application, uh, the proposal is for 867 homes, 1,870 square metres of uh, commercial space in a series of ground floor units open space, including a publicly accessible open space of about 8,870 square metres, including a park, car parking and cycle parking as on the screen. The site is uh, an R-shaped site shown in red here, of about two and a half hectares. The Cannon Road area is immediately to the north. The high road is to the east and that the depot part of the site has a frontage onto the high road. The western part is the goods yard and that has a frontage onto White Hart Lane and runs along the railway uh, lines. It's essentially an amalgamation of two sites, the depot which is uh, B on this plan to the north and the goods yard site which is identified as A. Here are just a few photographs of the 
uh, two parts of the site, the goods yard part on the left hand side and the depot on the right hand side. The high road frontage is within the um, North Tottenham Conservation Area, as is the White Hart Lane frontage of the site. Numbers 867 to 869, the high road and the bottom image on the screen here, are two, are two grade star, uh, sorry, grade two listed buildings. And the proposal is to convert those into six flats. The top image shows the locally listed station master's house and the proposal is to retain and convert that to um, commercial sort of leisure uh, use. And the middle image is the Grange, which is a grade two okay. listed building on White Hart Lane next to the entrance. The site shown in hatched blue here, or dotted blue, sorry, is part of a wider site allocation in the North Tottenham Area Action Plan, site allocation NT5, and the allocation is for a residential-led mixed use scheme. The allocation requires uh, development to accord with the principles of the High Road West Must Plan framework, and the right-hand image is shows the site superimposed on the uh, illustrative framework master Thanks. plan, which is in that document. There are a series of other policy designations set out on the screen here. I've referred to the listed buildings and the locally listed buildings. There is a complicated uh, sort of context to considering this application. The northern part of the R-shaped site that you can see here is the depot part of the site. The council granted planning permission in September 2020 for 330 homes. The goods yard part of the site uh, on the, the western part of the R next to the railway was granted planning permission on appeal in June 2019 for 316 homes. The print works uh, Applic site here, um, 819 to 829 the High Road, is a current planning application by the applicant for 72 homes. And planning permission has been granted for number 807, the High Road, for, for nine homes, uh, where I'm indicating now. On the other side of the High Road, uh, the applicant has received planning permission for Northumberland Terrace, the conversion of a number of listed buildings and the uh, construction of a business building at the rear to form a sort of cultural quarter. And then, of course, you know, last but not least is the um, planning permission in two, April 2016 for the Northumberland development project, the stadium and critically sort of development to the south of the stadium including 585 homes and a 36 storey building. So the extant schemes, which means basically they you know, planning permissions that could be implemented. Are shown here, the, the turquoise is the depot. Um, and the good yard are shown in, in pink, yellow and green here. Um, this these two permissions from uh, 2019 and 2020 grant permission for an 18 storey building in the, ye in the yellow, a 21 storey in the green and a 29 storey building in turquoise and the sort of lower rise buildings as you can see uh, shown on the blocks. The current application here is shown together with those outlines that were granted permission. So the proposed towers you'll see in detail in the sort of uh, brown brick uh, tile clad buildings, which we'll be discussing later. And the sort of shadow plans are those of outlines of the buildings that have already received planning permission. And that's a, a, a view of the showing the comparison, comparing the 
approved and the proposed from the west looking east. The um, development context is also just for completeness, just to make the point that the council's um, chosen development partner, Lendlease, has submitted a planning application for a wider part of the High Road West site allocation, as shown here. That's been uh, recently received and and actually accepted as valid just today. So over the coming days, that will be um, uh, being registered and um, consultation carried out on that. The important thing to note here is that that application allows for the approved um, goods yard and depot schemes, but not this application that's before you tonight. So in terms of the overview of the proposals, the there are three proposed towers along the western edge on the goods yard and the depot part of the site. The tower on the left, um, Good Yard block, block B, is up to 27 storeys. Block A is up to 32 storeys and Block A on the depot site is up to 29 storeys. I say up to because there are sort of shoulders to these towers which are typically sort of three to six storeys below the top of the cores that extend up to the maximum heights that are proposed. The proposed a publicly accessible park it, it, that was part of the depot planning permission would be provided and the depot part of the site, these blocks D, E, G and F, which I'm hovering on here, are very similar. They're almost identical to what's already been granted planning permission. If we look on plan now, and this is a plan with an illustrative master plan showing how the wider site allocation could be developed in the future uh, to demonstrate how the, the proposed scheme sits with a imagined future based on the principles of the council's master plan. So we see here um, the a proposed north-south street which is moved away from the western boundary where it was approved as part of the Goods Yard Extent Scheme and it now runs along the boundary here with the existing Peacock Industrial Park which we'll look at. Um, and through a series of squares and spaces and an east-west route uh, referred to as Peacock Lane coming in from the high road, there's no connection for vehicles, for, well, I should say for sort of cars, but, but walking and cycling, there would be very good connection and um, connections also with the Cannon Road area to the north. So in, in terms of permeability and, and connectivity from the north to White Hart Lane and the station to the south, um, that would be greatly improved by the proposed layout. Here's just the scheme in the existing context with the uh, industrial estate as it is today. So the depot um, part of the site, as I mentioned, is very similar to the uh, approved scheme apart from buildings A, B and C, these sort of amalgamated buildings and uh, uh, the 29 storey that I'm hovering on now, which we'll just um, look at in more detail. The location of the uh, tallest building on the depot um, is, is different from what has been approved previously. This tries to summarise the relationship with River Apartments uh, that is currently proposed now. So we can see that the proposed building would be between 30 and 35 metres away from uh, windows in that building and it would have a width of about 16.7 meters as its sort of narrowest point this is a slim tower narrowing as it at the north and southern ends the extent the approved schemes shows a different relationship with the 29-story approved building further away 
this is the illustrative scheme which shows it 50 which is over 51 meters away um, and with um, uh, seven and nine story buildings set sort of 18 17 to 25 meters away from the river apartments and the maximum parameters has a similar arrangement but it just allows for the tower to be slightly nearer we can come back to these um, during the discussion they may be helpful just a, a quick um, whiz at a couple of um, floor plans again focusing on block a a uh, and b on the depot site showing um, the arrangements at levels eight and nine and then as we go up the building the the the, the, the tower itself extending up to 29 stories we'll, there will be seven flats per core with um, three lifts for that core. This slide shows the originally submitted um, elevation or the western elevation of block ABC um, for the depot and on the left hand side and the right hand side is a revised elevation following discussions with officers and I just wanted to explain a little bit how we got from originally original submission to the revised scheme so I think this committee considered the then emerging scheme at PREAP and raised some concerns about the design of the um, proposed tall buildings, particularly their sort of architectural expression, basically, you know, what, you know, what they looked like was a, was, was a ma major concern here. The QRP raised um, similar and more sort of in-depth concerns, and the GLA, you know, the Mayor of London, has also raised some concerns about the architectural quality of the originally submitted scheme. So officers have worked hard with the applicant to uh, revisit that design. Um, we think it's there's been a simplification of the proposed cores, the taller elements of the proposed towers, um, a vertical alignment of the windows and balconies. You know, they were sort of hit and miss before. Uh, more solid base for the for the balconies, a reduction in the uh, proportion of glazing, so sort of glazing you know, void to, to solid. Uh, simplification of materials and essentially overall just trying to sort of calm down the the proposed elevations to help them uh, be more legible particularly uh, in sort of mid and longer views the good shard part of the scheme uh, as, as, I, as i mentioned before has this um Embankment Lane running from White Hart Lane on the right hand side to the northern square where it links in with the depot part of the site. Uh, commercial units and homes, duplexes coming down to ground wherever possible, so having lots of um, doors on streets. And if we look at one of the just one of the blocks as an example of the, the floor plans. We see here, this is block F, um, the Goodchild block F. We can see how the proposed homes on the western side would front onto the proposed Goodchild walk, which is a, a communal uh, green uh, um, amenity space, and then form courtyards and rising up uh, with um, generally pretty good sort of dual aspect and um, outlook and privacy for the future residents and this is again this is just one example there are several uh, lower rise buildings this is uh, good job block m just to give you uh, an, a feel for the type of buildings there's essentially brick essentially sort of three to nine story uh, sort of character for contextual buildings and looking at the proposal as a whole, looking west, so the left-hand side is White Hart Lane, 
the right hand side is River Apartments that we see here. And we can see how the proposed development would be generally the sort of background three to nine storeys uh, fronting streets uh, with the three towers on towards the western boundary rising up to 27, 32, 29 storeys but with shoulder heights below that giving a sort of distinctive rhythm and um, form to those proposed towers. Just a few these are accurate visual representations, so they, you know, they should be pretty good in terms of what, if if this was permitted and built, this is what it should look like from these locations. So here's a view looking up the high road from near Whitehall Street at the proposed three towers with River Apartments, um, the existing building at the northern end. A view from the high road next to Percy House, the grade two star listed building on the right hand side of the high road. A view from Northumberland Park, looking west. A view from the eastern side of the high road, uh, again looking sort of southwest, and here, here's the, the listed buildings 867, 869, the high road, that form part of the site and would be converted. A view from the northern pavement of Brantwood Road. A view from Love Lane, but it's a White Hart Lane station is just at my back, as it were, if I was taking this photo. And here's the station master's house, which would be um, retained and converted. And here's the lower rise blocks, proposed blocks coming down to White Hart Lane. A view from William Street, just a bit further back from White Hart Lane. Here's the Grange, the Grade 2 listed building. And finally, a view from Durban Road from the west of the railway tracks looking east. So it's probably worth just saying very briefly that the, I suppose the, the significance of the fact that there are two uh, extant planning permissions that could be implemented are that they establish a number of principles. One, they establish that the principle of incremental developments of the site allocation, you know, that providing the proposals demonstrate that they allow for other land in the site allocation to come forward in accordance with the principles of the master plan, then uh, incremental development is OK. The loss of the out-of-town out supermarket, the loss of the existing industrial floor space, subject to a certain minimum amount of business space. 35% affordable housing was established, tall buildings along the western edge of the site. And um, the, the principal, uh, which is a sort of national planning policy position anyway, that le lessens substantial harm to um, the significance of heritage assets, you know, it can be outweighed and was outweighed in these cases uh, because of the public benefits that the schemes would provide. And thirdly, lastly, sort of limited car parking on the site of between 0 0.16 and 0 0.25 to 1 for residential. So the proposed uses are, are similar to the uh, approved schemes. Um, and likewise, offices are recommending that there's a, a similar minimum amount of business space that would be secured. There would be a net gain of 865 homes, uh, which is 221 more than the approved schemes. The proposed dwelling mix, the type of homes and residential quality offices think are, are acceptable. The scheme safeguards the operation of the Peacock Industrial Estate in the short term by its location and design. And in the long term, it allows for uh, the, the, the fuller comprehensive redevelopment of the wider area. In terms of affordable housing, the offer is for 35.9% by habitable room. Uh, up to 40% if there's sufficient grant. The split would be 60-40 in line with North Tottenham's AAP 
policy, uh, 60% shared ownership in this case, and 40% low cost rent. 49% of the low cost rent homes would be family sized homes, so three and four bed. The council would have the first right to purchase up to 77 of the low cost rent homes. Um, this would be 61 at, at social rent values and 16 at London affordable rent values. That's more, that's 16 more than the approved schemes. Uh, there would be marketing for the, the shared ownership to, to maximise um, the sort of effectiveness of, of that type of affordable housing. And there would be early stage and break reviews to allow the council to review and um, uh, secure additional uh, uh, affordable housing. Um, and the low cost rent housing would be distributed across all of the proposed blocks across the site. So there's a there's a table in the in the committee report which sets that out. In terms of affordable housing, just just some statistics here. There would be 70 more affordable homes, 31% more, 20% uh, sorry, 20 more low cost rent homes, and um, 16 more family sized low cost rent homes with the council having the ability to purchase additional homes. We have um, gone through carefully um, the design and um, amenity aspects of the proposal and officers think that now the revised scheme um, and the architect expression of the proposed towers makes their height, form and appearance acceptable. The proposed lower buildings, we think, are of a good design. The proposed open space, including the park, uh, which could be extended further south in the future, and landscaping are welcome. It's an, it would be an accessible and safe environment. Uh, the connections with Cannon Road area are welcome. And you know we think the relationship with River Apartments and other nearby homes is acceptable. I won't dwell on this, but in, in terms of the tall buildings policy, the most up to date and the fullest policy is London Plan Policy D9, and that breaks down and requires consideration of tall buildings along sort of visual impacts, functional impacts, which are listed there, environmental impacts, and cumulative impacts. And the report goes into some detail and sort of um, assesses assesses those and finds the proposed tall buildings acceptable. In terms of heritage and conservation, the proposals would uh, retain and refurbish and in, bring back into use in terms of the station master's house. These two, uh, well, statutory listed buildings, 867, 869, and the locally listed station master's house. And uh, Officers have con concluded that whilst there would be s some less than substantial harm to a number of assets, heritage assets, which are outlined in the report, that the proposed public benefits, you know, when we when we do the sort of weighing the balance, um, the, the proposed public benefits justify the proposed scheme. Transport and car parking, um, as I mentioned, the, there is the vehicular access from the high road and White Hart Lane, but no through route for, for vehicles. There would be for pedestrians and cyclists. And I mentioned the improved connectivity and permeability that that would provide. And um, relatively low car parking with good levels of cycle parking, various measures to encourage sustainable travel and uh, electric vehicle charging points. And the impact on highways and public transport was considered acceptable and delivery and servicing arrangements are also considered acceptable by officers. Environmental issues, the scheme is proposed to connect to the district energy network, uh, which is coming to um, Tottenham from the, the, the energetic network. And that should, the timing should enable it to plug in 
uh, it safeguards and incorporates the mature trees on the high road, the four sort of London plane trees, which are really important to the street scene. There's uh, a good uh, biodiversity net gain and it's greater than the approved schemes. It's a sort of greener scheme, partly because policy has changed and suburban greening factor brought in by the new London plan has helped sort of push the scheme to become greener. Flood risk is low and drainage incorporated into the public realm and the other environmental issues, including wind and microclimates, um, we think are acceptable. The report recommends a number of uh, Section 106 planning obligations. This isn't comprehensive. The, 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 the report does list them out, obviously, comprehensively, which is in the recommendation. But these are the sort of key uh, in-kind and contributions that officers are recommending are secured by Section 106. So the recommendation is to grant planning permission with a five-year life uh, subject to the conditions and um, legal agreement and referral to the Mayor of London. So I'll, I'll leave it there. That was probably too long for you all, but sorry. There's a lot to say and uh, hence why the report is quite long as well, I'm afraid. So I'm just going to quickly um, show a fly through, um, given the complexity of the scheme, just to aid members, if I can get the technology to work. Yes. I wonder whether we cannot approach this matter by subject by subject. There's a whole load of stuff there. I find it completely unsatisfactory. A whole load. Of, how can you expect to get into this at nine o'clock at night when most people had a busy day? I, I, I would suggest it would be preferential to have a subject by subject. And the reports in the future and matters such that they should be laid out like that. Not it all jumps together and you sort of take a scattered, scattered gun approach if you want to try and sort some sense out, out of it. So I will politely request that we approach this matter now by, say, if you want to take uh, housing first or, or design or whatever, but not all over the place because it, it makes no sense to me otherwise. Okay. There is some sense in what you're saying there, I think, Councillor Rice. I'd, I'd ask um, Mr. McNocker to um, show us the, um, what do you say, fly through video, uh, fasten your seatbelts. Um, and then I think maybe a way forward would be to um, direct our questions uh, based on four subject areas, which I'll outline in a minute. So hopefully this speaks for itself, but I'll, I'll give some rough commentary. This is looking from White Hart Lane with the um, station master's house on the left there. And this is traveling north um, from White Hart Lane into the development site. This is the private space at the rear of the um, development site adjacent to the railway then, and some of the um, private spaces within the development on the podiums. And some of the public space within the public realm. On the right hand side there you have the Peacock Industrial Estate shown as a massing diagram and then this is heading north um, through one of the lanes through the development with the Industrial Estate on the right. It's the base of the central tower. Sorry, first tower actually, this is the base of the central tower now. And 
and again another public space. This is heading east back towards the high road through the area of park. This is now where the B&M home store is. And then looking back with them back towards the high road. And then the list of buildings on the right there. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Just hold the thought a sec. So I think if if members um, are taking on what Councillor Rice suggested, I think if we go into four broad categories um, for questions uh, and answers, it might help the applicant team as well, actually. Um, so broadly speaking, we'll, we'll start with uh, master planning in the first instance, so how this works within the scheme for the whole area, etc. The second one will be the design, heritage and tall buildings. Are you all making notes? Third will be on actual what housing we're getting. That's the uh, size, tenure, affordability, um, layouts, that sort of thing. Um, amenity space, place space, all those sort of things associated with that. And then fourthly, the social, um, public realm, infrastructure, livability, um, um, infrastructure, additions, parks, all that sort of wider. Um, so if, if we stuck to those areas, it might, um, might make things easier. So I saw Councillor Say with her hand up first and then Councillor Ross. I need to take my reading glasses off for this. Um, so Say, Ross. Mitchell, Corley Harrison so far. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, my uh, first problem I have with this is, is it past, uh, part of the master plan or isn't it? I've got no idea. Um, I don't really understand how it fits with the master plan. Um, my understanding of the master plan was that the local authority would be assembling the land because we have compulsory purchase powers and nobody else does. Uh, but this doesn't seem to have anything to do with that. Uh, and yet it uses the master plan when it feels like it. So it talks about the Peacock Park, but actually it's a Peacock industrial estate, for example. So I'm very confused about the status of the whole thing right from the get-go. Thanks. Who, who wants to take that? Yeah, I can quickly take that one. So the principle of, of this um, piecemeal approach where you build out parts of the master plan has been established in the extant consents. Um, the High Road West Master Plan framework has been in place and is referred to in the site allocation. So that has been carried out through previous planning permissions um, and this continues this. Um, it evolves the master plan, it doesn't follow it slavishly, but again that principle has been established. Um, as Graham said earlier, there is an application for the entire site allocation that has just been submitted, but that's not the application before us now, and um, the approach that's been taken here has been accepted previously. Uh, can I ask then why, if um, the master plan says the indicative heights of um, tower, tower blocks should be 10 to 18 storeys? Yes, so again, um, as established by previous permissions, the, the heights have increased from what's set out in the, the master plan. Um, that's a, a natural progression um, over time that um, housing numbers have increased and therefore um, densities have increased. The, the previous permissions did that and this development then um, does that again. Just, just to add, the report does acknowledge that. I mean, it acknowledges and, and tries to assess the scheme against the master plan. So it acknowledges that the master plan says that it gives those indicative heights, but um, assesses it based on that, but based also on the planning permissions that are being granted and the tall buildings policy um, 
that I mentioned, particularly London Plan Policy D9. So uh, we've assessed it with the framework master plan very much in mind, along with the two planning permissions and how policy has evolved since the master plan was established, which was 2014 now. OK, last one. So can you explain why we've now got another application from Lendlease for the same area? It, presumably it's the same area. What's going on? It's um, it's not uncommon to have multiple applications on, on land. People can make planning applications. The applicant in this case owns this land and it's got two permissions and it's coming back to seek permission for, um, uh, if you like, an enhanced scheme uh, with additional homes but it's um it's quite it's quite um uh, able to do that and the council as the planning authority can determine all sorts or any number of applications on on a piece of land it makes things very complicated for us all but it's it's the way that the market operates and the way that the planning system is established to facilitate uh facilitate the the the, um, the 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 market. Thanks, um, Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chair. Um, mention was made of um, two extant planning permissions, and all the way through the the agenda, it talks about fallback positions. But I wasn't quite sure what planning permissions are extant and what aren't, because earlier on in the presentation, mentioned a planning permission going back to. April 2016, which surely has must have run out now, even if it's five years. Um, so that's my first question. The second question was in general terms um, about the agenda itself, and and Councillor Rice mentioned sort of piecemeal spatter, scatter, scatter gun approach. About as I was reading through the agenda, I was reading um, on page 109. QRP was not able to support the application, but on page 43, sorry, 143, they said they were. And then on um, page 327, uh, the deputy mayor a couple of months ago said he's he's not, the application doesn't fully comply with the London plan. So I just, I mean, it's an extremely complicated um, application. And I only got the agenda on Friday um, and spent a day and a half reading through it. And, I, you know, I, just those three things have confused me. Um, Councillor, I'm sorry if it's not clear. The, the report follows the standard report structure. And in this case, because it is very complicated, what it seeks to do is to uh, discuss and assess the scheme under the standard headings. But at the end of each one, uh, include uh, an assessment of the fallback position and the fallback position is a material planning consideration it's because the applicant has planning permission for these two other schemes and could implement them and therefore it's a material consideration in terms of not just considering the scheme on its merits but also considering the difference between the what's already been approved and what's proposed. And those differences are both positive and negative. You know, there may be additional harm, there may be um, uh, additional negatives, and there may be additional benefits. So what the report tries to do is for each topic to uh, succinctly summarise that the, the difference between the approved, the approved schemes and the scheme before you tonight in that organised way. The You mentioned the... 2016 planning permission uh, for the Northumberland Development uh, Project. That's because it's been implemented, you know, the stadium has been built and the way that the planning permission was granted allows for future development to the south of the, the stadium to come forward. So it, 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 that is a material consideration as well. Um, the Mayor of London and the GLA Stage 1 reports very typically, without exception, say that um, the proposals 
that are considered by the, the mayor, in this case the deputy mayor, um, do not fully accord with the London plan. All stage one reports say that and they set out the reasons why GLA officers think that, you know, that there are issues. We've sought to, as officers here, we've sought to address those and the mayor will consider the application again. If there's a resolution to grant tonight, the application would be referred back to the mayor of London and the mayor of London would then have the opportunity to consider, you know, what we've all done with his comments. So that is a very typical process and that's how it is. I mean, the QRP have considered the scheme on three or four occasions and the report sets out in a table form uh, its latest response, uh, its latest comments and officer response to them. So again, uh, we've tried to be as clear as we can on a very complicated issue. I suppose the question I think that you've just missed there was so the QRP after their final assessment, are they supportive or not supportive? Well, yeah. it, the it has the the application scheme um, uh, was considered by uh, QRP, and the revisions to the application are in direct response to some of their concerns. So the table, table twelve on page one hundred and nine to one <laughs> fifteen, goes through the QRP's comments and gives an officer response to how the revised scheme addresses those comments. So the scheme hasn't gone back to QRP since um, since the uh, um, since it considered it last, but the applicants and officers have worked together to try and address the concerns of the QRP. Thank you. So, if I may, Chair, that, that comment on page 109 at the bottom of the, the paragraphs above the table, it says the panel is not able to offer support. In other words, officers have, have gone through all their comments. And so that comment on page 143, 6.5.86, that's the latest position, is that right? Sorry, can you say you So on the on page hundred and nine, just above the, the table, it says the panel is not able to offer support. And then on six point yep. five point eight six on page hundred and forty three, that's the latest position. Yes, it's the, I mean what what six point five point eight six says, Councillor, is that officers think that um QRP's concerns have been successfully addressed. It's not trying to say that the QRP thinks that. So we think we've addressed the QRP's comments in that table. And you're right, when they when they made their comments, um, they they weren't able to support it and they made a series of comments and that table tries to address their concerns. And what um, paragraphs six Point five point eighty six says is that officers think that the revised scheme does address the QRP's comments successfully, but the QRP have not uh, reconsidered it. So it's what of officers think that the scheme has been revised to address the QRP's concerns. Okay, thanks. I think that's clear. Um, Councillor Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Thanks. On the um, issue of the master plan, so one of the points is that um, the buildings, the tall buildings, should use the uh, river apartments as a reference point and then descend in height moving south, um, which clearly they don't. Um, I mean, I'm conscious that the extant planning permission for the depot site is already at 29 storeys, so that um, that is higher than river apartments, but thereafter the extant planning permissions did decrease as you traveled south. So 
Um, and you did say at the beginning about the importance of complying with the master plan. So I'm not really clear why we're now, it seems comfortable that it moves from 29 up to 32 uh, and then only down to 27 at the southern end. So could you just clarify that, please? So the, the, the master plan um, established a principle of, of taller buildings being on the western edge and um, generally buildings heights descending to White Hart Lane. Generally, the low level buildings do do that and there's about a from White Hart Lane north um, into the site. There's for about 100 metres, it's essentially uh, low rise buildings of three to nine stories and the proposed tower has got taller but it's also got further away from White Hart Lane so as discussed in the report in page um, 117 and it we acknowledge that it doesn't sit wholly comfortably with the master plan framework and some of its principles, but the underlying approach is to reduce height down to White Hart Lane. As you mentioned, the, there's a planning permission in place for the depot uh, block A, which is 29 storeys, which already sort of breaks, if you like, that uh, principle of river apartments being uh, the, the tallest building in, in that spine. Uh, and officers consider that the the sort of proposed sort of undulation of from 27 to 32 and then down to 29 and down to river apartments is um, is acceptable. It's an acceptable sort of evolution, if you like, of that principle. But we make no bones that it doesn't um, sit wholly with the with the master plan. But we're, we've assessed it and found in our consideration that that approach is acceptable. Thanks. Um, Councillor Corley Harrison, I think you're next. We're still just on master plan, yeah? Please, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, well, I'm still a bit confused. It seems like we're throwing it a little bit out of the window, the master plan. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I think last week, whenever it was, Len Lees came, they said that the master plan had 2,600 homes, 940, 960 affordable, something like that, was it? I can't recall exactly. Now, there's a difference here in the number of affordable homes being put forwards versus the extemp um, application, as I read it. So how does that affect the master plan in terms of number of affordable homes? If this gets approved with a different number, for argument's sake, does that have a knock-on impact on where affordable homes are located elsewhere on the wider High Road West site? Or do we get, end up with more or less? I think, Councillor, they're, they're separate proposals, so I don't think you should think that by making a decision this evening that um, you're prejudicing the lend lease application and you'll be able to consider the lend lease application in due course in you know five or six months time um, and the affordable offer that which is included in that in that um, scheme but what's before you tonight is what you're determining and um, the report sets out and I try to summarize in the in the presentation the uh, affordable housing offer and how it differs from the approved scheme, the, the two extant schemes here. So it, the, the affordable housing offer is different and it's an improved offer because there are additional homes. There's a slightly higher percentage of nearly 36% as opposed to 35%. And, you know, there are additional low cost rent homes, a, a, additional family sized uh, low cost rent homes in this scheme. So I think it's it's this scheme that you, 
that you are being asked to determine tonight, not not the lend lease proposals, and they will come forward and be justified on their own um, terms. And Councillor Ibrahim. Oh yeah, mine was um, my substantive question is going to be later on because I recognise you want to have it in um, sections. But mine is just an observation about the confusion that I can ob obviously relate to because obviously um, I it was only when I was obviously got this on Friday, but when I was going through it initially that I was like oh, okay, and then I realised it's actually because it's you've got a different applicant name there as you've got um on the which uh, transpires and it, that came out in the addendum so it's it was only like when i was um quite a, a bit through it that i figured out it was the tottenham hotspur application because you've got good yard tottenham limited which i presume is just a new name do you know what i mean it's just some a, a name for a company um that's been registered but it does it, maybe it, it you know that should be made clearer at the front of the of the document. Um, thanks for that, and Councillor Morris. No, I'm okay. fine, thank you. So we're done for master planning. Thanks, everyone. So let's move on to design and the tall buildings and all the as that aspect of it. Um, Councillor Corley Harrison. I don't really know what section this falls in, so I, I'll put it in now actually beforehand. But um, I think page 76. Don't go back to it. Seventy-six, three point four two. This application is full, whereas the extant goods yard consent is wholly in outline. The extant depot consent is partly in outline and partly in full. This makes direct comparison difficult. I mean, to reiterate everyone else's point, this is incredibly hard to decipher because we're comparing apples with oranges. We're being asked to look at a master plan, but not look at the master plan. We're being asked to address the application in front of us with reference to the previous application, but without reference to the previous application. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost impossible, given we've already heard two applications tonight as well. Um, on page 80, uh, <clears throat> second bullet point, which comes from the design officer, says, uh, the detailed design of the three towers represent a tremendous improvement on the illustrative schemes in the previous hybrid approvals, are legible and sculpturally interesting in longer views. Yet the QRP on 108 basically says, that they can't support the application primarily because of the large building and the designs. I know design is subjective, but I mean, that's quite a difference of opinion between the council's design officer and the council's quality review panel. Um, so I, I would quite like the design officer to justify um, that comment. And then 127, uh, there's reference to policy DM6 on the design of tall buildings and impact on heri heritage assets. And again, the heritage, from what I read, the heritage of officer, whatever you want to, want to call it, <coughs> section 6.924, the towers would have a seriously negative impact on the wider setting of the listed building, referencing the Grange, and reduce the positive effects of retaining the traditional built proportions. The harm that would be caused to its wider setting by the proposed house would outweigh the positive benefits derived by the improvement to the immediate setting. And that overall the proposal, proposals will cause less than substantial harm. I mean, it's just said that it's, it's not in line with it. That, that paragraph alone contradicts itself, does it not? I mean, I, it just it feels like the whole document is a contradiction where again it's very very difficult to read i'm still not totally clear on which design we're looking at um in terms of it talks in some parts about 
the tiles that we've seen before and the three different colors, how these have changed to a, a matted appearance. But then the designs that we saw in front of us, it looked like a brick built building. I, I mean, that's, I don't, I don't know what the material is that's being used. That's quite hard to decipher. Um, and generally, I find that the, the amount of stuff that's in this pack related to the design and the height of the buildings, which I'm, sh I'm sure others will bring up, um, which I'm not going to, means that the other stuff that we would normally look at in an application, things like transport, things like um, the ecological impact, we're not going to get to those. We're not going to be able to address those this evening. There's not going to be time to do so. It's too big an application for that. So we're not really considering the whole application. We're considering the, ma the major parts of the application because there's not going to be sufficient time for us to go into detail on every single aspect, even though, I'm sh even though we should do. Let's be realistic, right? Otherwise, we will be here until tomorrow. So for me, I think that... Um, well, I think that the whole meeting should have been readdressed, but um, I suppose I'd like the design officer to justify the comments, first of all, that contradict QRP so wildly, and also I'd like confirmation on exactly what is meant from the heritage officer, where they said it's less than substantial harm, and yet it very clearly quotes the substantial harm that it's causing. Well, we'll go to, I think we'll go over to Mr. Truscott to start with, please. <coughs> Thank you, councillors. Uh, yes, so what's happened is that there's there have been a, a significant number of changes to the de detailed design of the towers since the QRP, um, since the last quality review panel review of the proposals uh, in recognition of the significant concerns that the QRP had, and indeed I had at that time. Uh, I think there have been significant improvements to the detailed design of the towers that resolve the issues that the QRP had with, the, with, with them at that stage. It's important to recognise the QRP were, were happy with the design of the lower rise elements, as was I. Um, it, it was purely the design of the towers that was a major concern. Um, the relationship between the towers and the plinth shoulder buildings was mentioned. That's been improved with the introduction of the shadow gap and the clearer definition of the detailed design of the tower, the so-called jacket to the towers. The, um, the, the change in colours was from one tower being in a terracotta coloured ceramic cladding, one tower in a green coloured ceramic cladding, and one tower in a blue coloured ceramic cladding. They were all now three being a terracotta coloured ceramic cladding or terracotta earth tones. So they'll be in a similar field of colours to the brick, but uh, they won't be brick, they'll be in uh, a, a cladding material. Um, but it will be a, a, in that range of terracotta earth brick colours, very similar colour rather than three very different colours. The detailed design of that cladding system has been drastically simplified so that it works in longer views. That was a key change to um, make it really clear when you take a longer view of those towers that there's a difference between the, the so-called jacket of the tower, the crown, the top of the tower, with the element that drops down from the crown down to the ground and helps mark the entrance to each of the towers. So the, um, the, the distinguish, the, the way the towers um, design in long views is, is, is distinctive, has been significantly improved. This also helps the way the tower entrances are pinpointed and, and marked out and, and form part of the upper part of the towers. And the way the towers sit on the base has been improved by the separation of the jacket element from the shoulder elements of the low rise, six, seven, eight storey elements that they sit on. Um, the QRP went on to say that they felt things like the streets and spaces were very promising and that the um, quality of accommodation was, was, was good and, and, and it's been improved. The environmental issues um, was, were, were regarded as good and they've been improved. And um, so the, it, it comes down to the amendments that have been made during the process that have resolved the QRP issues. Um, I think that's probably covers the, everything you wanted from me. Can anyone come in on the heritage, please? Yes, um, I think just to explain that broadly, th there's basically two impacts on the Grange, um, one positive, one negative, that the tower has a negative impact and um, 
this the impact of the low rise buildings surrounding it have a, a positive impact. So weighing those up, um, it's found that there's less than substantial harm. We do have the conservation officer um, who could explain that in a bit more detail um, virtually. But yeah, that, that that's the simplistic um, assessment of it. Should we hear from the conservation officer? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. I'm looking around, I don't know. Here we go. Over to you, um, Elisabetta. Hello, good evening. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> yes, I think... What yeah, we can't hear you. Oh, hello. We can't hear you at the moment. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, if that was, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Um. Maybe try without the headphones. I'm not sure. I thought... Can you hear me? Very, very faintly, yes. Uh, keep going, keep talking, please. Can you hear me? Yes, got you now. Thank you. All right, let me try with headphones. Yeah, what, what I, I need to clarify is that when we look at, uh, at the development, which is obviously extensive, uh, we look at uh, uh, all the individual components. In this specific case, we are looking at, uh, at the Grange, um, the Grange building. So as it's been uh, very, um, very clearly uh, summarized, um, the proposed development clearly enhances the building. Can you still hear, hear me? Yes. And uh, um, clearly there is some positive action that comes from the proposal, which is going to enhance the, the heritage asset. And there are serious improvements to, his surround, to the surroundings. Uh, improvement mainly provided by 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 the lower buildings. So by this ability to uh, create a sort of a gradual increase in height and to mediate between historic building and the new development. By nature, the challenge is going to be a different type, a different type of, uh, we're going to be a different type of the much more prominent presence. So it is the very nature of the towers. Uh, obviously, it's not, uh, it's not something that is, uh, is coming from uh, 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 a particularly bad design or anything. And obviously, we have to, um, when we look at, at the heritage uh, context, uh, we need to formulate if there is an impact on what type of uh, application it has on the historic environment and on the heritage assets of this new development. Uh, we have to get to a point where we define if there is any harm. And this harm obviously can be on a, on a spectrum uh, that can be also meaningful, but still there is an impact. Impact. So still there is some harm, and in this case, obviously, the tall element is going to impact the established scale of the historic environment. But uh, this this is really what that paragraph is trying to say. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> I think I had Councillor Mitchell um, indicating next. Thank you. Um, I've got a number of points which I think come under the heading design. First is about daylight and sunlight. So on page 80, it says that um, the daylight and sunlight assessments show only minor effects compared to the expectation of the development previously agreed. So I just wanted to check. So the table on page 169 and 170, I'm assuming does compare these proposals with what was previously agreed, in which case, I mean, in almost all cases, it has a negative impact. It, it's, it's at least minor adverse impact, certainly on daylight, uh, and in some cases becomes moderate and even major in a couple of instances. So I just wanted to clarify that because, I mean, certainly in 
in terms of the first line of that table, uh, river apartments. I mean, the proposed uh, tower block is now so much closer. Uh, you know, one assumes it would have an adverse impact compared with the previous proposals. Um, moving on to the issue of identification of any social housing, at the bottom of page 103, it says that low cost rent homes would either be independently accessed from the street or would have their own discrete stair and lift cores. And then over the page, um, in paragraph 6416, it does though say that all proposed homes are tenure blind. Um, I just wanted to clarify this because the statement at the bottom 103 alarmed me. I noticed that the distribution of um, some of the low cost rent, for example, block A at the top of page 104, there's 205 market units and just four low cost rent. So when it talks about separate, uh, independently accessed from the street, is that because we're talking about the two-storey masonettes, which are referred to elsewhere in the in the document? In which case, having your own front door on the street is fine. But I was, could you just clarify though the reference in particular to discrete stair and lift cores for any low-cost rent homes? Um, I mean, I also had a question or query in terms of the um, the reduced gaps between the tower blocks. Um, on page 111, for example, identifies um, how the gap between the, um, the goods yard block A and the depot block A, that's been reduced considerably from just over 45 metres to 28. And as we've already mentioned, the, the gap with river apartments is down by about 20 metres. And I wasn't really clear about the justification for that. I then had a question about single aspect um, flats. So page 146 um, states that the majority are at least dual aspects, but the majority is 54%. So it would appear 46% a single aspect. And I know we normally get told that dense urban developments of this kind inevitably have some single aspect units, but it just seems an awful lot to me. Um, on page 136 there's a, and 137, there's a table about um, views and what impact the development would have. I, I couldn't really, to be honest, understand this. How can we say that the things will have a major beneficial impact on views from different uh, areas around? I mean, of course we're going to be able to see a lot of the development, whether you're looking from the High Road or, or White Hart Lane. I mean, whether you think it's good design or not is, is down to the individual. Like, how, how can we judge that well, actually, this is a major benefit that we can now see these tower blocks. I didn't quite follow that. And my final design point, on page 200, which deals with waste collection, it says that the access road must have a minimum width of five metres. But on page 181, it says that the embankment lane starts off at 5.5 metres at White Hart Lane, but narrows down to 3.7 metres at the northern end. So it's not wide enough to take um, waste collection vehicles. So how are we going to deal with that? Thanks. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> so in terms of your, co your comment and sort of question about low cost rent homes and distribution, yes, the first, the first thing uh, first is to say that the four homes in block A of the Goodyear block would be the sort of duplex masonettes that face the street. And so they would be good quality sort of um, 
doors on the street, uh, two-storey, family-sized homes. It's it, Again, it's very common and registered providers, housing associations positively want um, low-cost rent homes to have their own lift and stair cores uh, for management and maintenance reasons. It helps keep service charges down and helps keep rents affordable. So for most schemes, if not all schemes of, of, of this sort of scale and nature, where uh, the intention is to incorporate low cost rent homes within blocks, they are designed uh, to have be served by their own lift and stairs cause and that's quite common. Um, in terms of the, the design blind approach, it's certainly in terms of the external appearance, there's no discernible difference in the external appearance of buildings of different tenure. So you can't tell which homes are low cost rent and which homes are a private buy by looking at them from the outside. Um, in terms of the reduced gaps between the proposed towers, you referred to that page 111 and that's uh, the, the officer's summary response to QRP. In terms of justification, that is really set out elsewhere in the report when uh, the, the, the officers uh, acknowledge the differences with the High Road West Must Plan and assess how the scheme is different from the approved schemes uh, that, that have already been granted permission. The justification and what's driven the uh, the relocation and repositioning of the three towers is one about evening out the distances between spaces, better aligning the towers with the east-west routes. So if we look, um, and if I can get a it may be best if I get a uh, the presentation back up. Can I share? And if I so we can see here the location of the three proposed towers are better aligned with proposed east west routes across the site. It also means that the southern tower on the goods yard is moved further away from the Grange. And we just heard the you know the conservation officer uh, uh, comment on the sort of balancing between the positive impacts on the Grange and the negative impacts of the tower, the proposed tower here. So the, real, the relocation of the towers from what has been approved, it's a mixture of increase in height, but also a, a sort of evening out of their location of, to better align with the east-west routes and to move further away from the listed buildings and locally listed buildings on White Hart Lane. In terms of a single aspect, you referred to um, uh, page 146 in the report where, yes, I mean, we set out that just over half of the proposed homes would be dual aspect. Uh, I think we acknowledge that that's, you know, not uh, a particularly high figure but that in this case, the proposed quality of the homes in terms of their daylight, sunlight, it, it, their overheating or their lack of overheating uh, makes the, and the outlook and the privacy that they would enjoy means that the overall amenity of the homes and people living in them in the future, it would be high, we think they would be high quality the single aspect homes are, are often also larger than the minimum required in the London plan. So there's some sort of compensatory sort of quality of the home, if you like, 
um, to to uh, to compensate for the single aspect nature. So overall, thinking about the pack, the balancing all the various requirements that make a good home, we think that the the proposals do that and help optimise the site um, and lots of the single aspect homes would be in the east and west facing towers. They would have seven homes per core, which is in line with the with the Mayor of London's London plan policy. So in terms of the quality of you know, access by the three lifts, the um, uh, uh, not corridor access, they would all meet that and they would have um, good views as well from the sort of east and west and there's no south facing single aspect. So overall, we think that it's acceptable. In terms of views, and you, you refer to, I think, 136 and 137, what the report tries to do here is set out and summarise what the environmental statement does. So this is the applicant's assessment of the viewpoints uh, in its townscape and visual impact assessment. What we as officers say is that generally, generally we uh, agree with that assessment, uh, but not in all cases. Um, we, we identify um, a number of cases where we we don't necessarily agree with the sort of degree of benefit that the applicant is, you know, is, is identifies in the environmental statement. So again, we're being sort of upfront in terms of where we disagree. It's the applicant's assessment, and we're trying to set out to you, you know, where we agree and where we don't agree with that assessment, and the shaded uh, views are the ones that we think um, maybe the applicants we, we disagree with the level of sort of, you know, beneficial. Um, impact on the townscape, but we do accept that in other cases there would be um, benefits of having the proposed taller buildings. In terms of vehicle access and, and waste management, yes, I mean Embankment Lane, and it's up on the screen now, would would narrow as uh, from about this point, but but the waste. The waste servicing would be from the, the wider part of the street, so it only narrows at the, the northern part of the proposed lane where it meets the northern square. So the the council sort of waste uh, officers comments and uh, would still be sort of satisfied from the part of the street, which is wide enough to accept um, refuse vehicles on. Yeah. Um, Councillor Mitchell, you can come back. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to come back then on the differentiation between access to low cost rental homes and other homes. So, um, yeah, I'm happy with the point you make about duplex um, apartments. But to take, looking at the table on page 104, so obviously there are some blocks that are entirely low cost rent. But where there's a split, so for example, on the um, Goods yard site, block F, is a mix of 12 market flats and 22 low cost rent. Um, so what we're saying there is then there would be separate lifts for those low cost rent properties within that block. That's what it appears to be saying at the bottom of page 103. And similarly, I assume block D on the depot, which is a mix of 22 low cost rent and 16 intermediate. <laughs> that we'd have a separate um, lift core for them. I can't see how service charge is potentially impacted by having that split of tenure. Well, this is something maybe the maybe the applicant to, could help clarify later on. Um, yes, yeah, should we hold that thought and, and, and ask that later then? I'm trying to yeah. interject here because um, people will notice we're getting close to 10 o'clock. Um, we don't have to suspend standing orders. We continue with an item, um, which I propose we do. Um, so just to let everyone know, I think we need to, to hear this. Um, but if we can try and, I don't know how, it's a very big thing, try and speak more quickly. But 
it's going to take a while. Um, so just to let you know, we are continuing. So where were we then? We're all done with Councillor Mitchell and I had Councillor Morris next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I was looking at daylight and sunlight and um, only 59% of the main living rooms um, satisfy uh, BREE guidelines. Um, it says, however, in the report that the assessments were done on the lower floors um, and they would, um, daylight and sunlight would improve uh, as you got higher up the building. So I was just interested to know why assessments weren't done all over the build uh, or different heights and why just on lower floors and is 59% really high enough. Um, and then in terms of daylight and sunlight uh, for neighbouring buildings, I think it was about 56 or 57 um, out of 103 neighbouring buildings assessed uh, would meet um, the BREE guidelines of sunlight and daylight, which uh, didn't seem very much to me. Um, I think to quote the report, it said that six properties are likely to experience noticeable impact on daylight and sunlight. Um, and uh, I believe that includes um, the school as well, which I think is concerning. Um, and then there's the overshadowing. Um, so we've got um, seven Mallory Court gardens. And again, the school playground is uh, overshadowed. So I really do feel the school has taken a hit um, with this uh, development. Um, the report says that the boundary wall um, overshadows um, the um, the playground anyway, but I don't think you can compare a playground boundary wall with a 32 storey building. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, the reason for why applicants assess the low floors is that's the worst case. So if if the if homes on the proposed lower floors are assessed and found acceptable, um, then homes on the upper floors should be better, as you point out, and have greater light. So it's it's quite typical that assessments are, uh, are done on a sort of worst case basis. Um, so that's why the scheme uh, and the environmental statement assesses assesses those. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of daylight and sunlight, yes, I mean that the. the all levels of planning policy require the application of the BRE guidelines in a flexible way. They were established uh, on a national basis. They're not sort of designed particularly for the London context. And the, the, the London plan, the mayor's guidance, uh, encourages local planning authorities to apply them flexibly. And there's lots of um, appeals in in the London area that have established that it's what you're left with. There's there's um it's a complicated there's a there's a sort of proportional loss of daylight and sunlight, but then it's also what you're left with, which is the most important. And in this case, uh, most people's homes uh, they would be. The retained levels of vertical sky components sort of daylight that hits the windows would be in in the mid teens, which is seen as an acceptable level. So there's lots of um, you know, planning uh, appeals and, and um, uh, decisions that uphold that, including by by Haringey. You know, that's what we think is a sort of reasonable level in terms of the boundary wall. I mean, the, the, the report goes into quite a lot of detail about the height and its retention along the dep uh, the northern boundary of the depot. Certainly, uh, when the depot, the original depot application was being considered, there was, um, I think, concern by some local people that that height, the wall should be kept. And when we were on our site visit, you know, I pointed out that that wall has been retained for that reason. Um, the so this application does retain that. It doesn't seek to, to reduce it. In terms of impacts on, on the school and, and its playground, uh, there would be some 
uh, impacts, but schools are less sensitive in terms of daylight and sunlight than, than homes and the level of impact uh, on that. Uh, again, it's, it's very similar, if not the same, as the impacts in the approved depot scheme. So the, the proposed buildings uh, block E and well, we can look here, block E. So the school is on the lower floors of this building here. Block E and its massing is very similar to what was approved in outline. And this is where I'm afraid it's complicated and uh, you're not wishing to uh, uh, annoy you, but it's just a matter of fact that the previous scheme was granted in outline and now this is a full application. But the, but the actual scale of the proposals are very similar. So the, the, the impacts are very similar and they've already been considered acceptable. Would you like to come in now? Yeah, OK. Thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, just a few people have commented about design and um, things being subjective, which is absolutely right. But for the purposes of tonight, I know you're very familiar um, decisions by the committee have to be made in accordance with the development plan. So we have a framework to make those um, assessments on design and, and heritage. Um, so the report, as you will have spotted, does go through all of the development plan policies and assesses the proposal in light of those adopted policies. So it, it, it does give a, a good framework to do that. And, and, and the officers, you've heard from the um, design officer and the heritage officer, and the planning officer coming to the conclusion on that. Um, so just just a reminder that it is it is with reference to the development plan policies. Thanks. Now you may not have, but if anybody now has any questions on the final category, which is um, the sort of public realm, social infrastructure, livability, um, that sort of thing. So I have Councillor Ross, then Mitchell and Morris. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we, we, when we went to the site visit, we talked about the um, extra play area at the school um, and comments were made about how um, it's not suitable for a school to share its what would be its playground with, albeit after school hours, with uh, public realms. So I just wondered if um, that is still going to go ahead. Um, my second question is about the bridge over the railway line. Um, that again, we, when we just talked about um, that on the site visit, um, I take the view that if that's not going to go ahead, it's going to be extremely difficult to do. Um, why is it still mentioned? Um, and the other question was on page 187. It talks about the um, the heating um, heat generated at the energy centre is that is that from the Edmonton incinerator proposed seven borough Edmonton incinerator just wondered if that was where the the uh, the, the den will get its um, yeah, yes from. it is councillor just to quickly come back on that yeah Do you want to come back about the shared um, playground? In, in terms of the, so the application includes an open space next to the primary school, uh, Brookhouse Primary School. It's about 350 square metres. It's the same sort of character of space and the same proposal that was approved as part of the depot planning commission. At that stage, and I remember, you know, there was a discussion about it in committee at that time about the proposal for it to be dual use, so that it's uh, a, an extension to the school playground during school day, uh, but that it could be made available to uh, local people living in the scheme at other times of the day. Where we got to then and what we're continuing to recommend now is that uh, subject to a, a planning condition and the agreement of a management plan that could be possible. So 
but it is subject to agreeing a management plan with the school and for the school to be comfortable and happy with, you know, in terms of safety and um, whatever checks would need to be made following um, that space being used by the wider community. So it's in principle, we think it's a good idea. It's a good use of space, you know, for, out, for school holidays, other times it could be used. Uh, we just need to get a, an agreed detailed management plan. So what we're recommending is that, again, it's found acceptable in principle, but it's subject to a condition. And just very quickly to add here, that condition is set out on page 410, condition 28. So that follows the wording through from the previous approval and, and goes into the, the detail that was agreed by the committee in terms of the parameters um, under which that space would be used. Why are we mentioning the bridge if it's not going to happen, I think was the other question. <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, in terms of the bridge, if if you turn to page 121 in the report, again, you know what officers acknowledge that um, it, for the for the approved depot scheme, Peacock Lane, the east west 